Uh, give me one moment. Uh, I just need to, uh, yeah, get my file open. Just one moment. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Warm welcome to the session symposium on geometry and topology of 87th annual conference of Indian Mathematical Society and International Meet, which is uh, online. The convener for this session is uh, Professor uh, Krishnendu uh, uh, Gongopadhyay, uh, who is the professor at uh, ISER Mohali. Now, uh, welcome, sir. Uh, Thank you. Professor uh, Pranav Pandit, Pralat uh, Chatterjee, Pranab uh, Sardar, uh, Samik Basu, uh, Subhajoy Gupta, and Arpan uh, uh, Kabiraj are joining, uh, are joined as a speakers. Now uh, I hand over this session to the respected convener. Uh, over to you, sir. Oh, thank you, Ashish ji. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, and thank you for all your help. So I must uh, say that we have six speakers, so our session may go until uh, 7 p.m. I hope uh, that would not be a problem. And you can you can, you can authorize me uh, to moderate it. I will be happy to do it. All right. So uh, let's start the lecture without um, further spending time. So I would welcome uh, all speakers uh, in this session. So uh, Dr. Pranav Pandit will give the first lecture. Uh, so Professor uh, Pandit is a reader at ICTS uh, TIFR Bangalore. Uh, so he uh, completed his uh, PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. And before that, he was a undergraduate student from the India Statistical Institute. Uh, prior to joining ICTS, Pranav was a postdoc at the University of Vienna and a visiting researcher at the uh, IHES Paris. So he works at the broad area of uh, category theory, geometry, and mathematical physics. So over to you, Pranav. You can uh, share your screen and start the lecture. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, let us see. Um, okay, uh, I am sharing my screen now. Does everyone see? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, uh, it's can visible, see. sir. And uh, yeah, I'm not able to make. Okay, so do you see exactly my PDF file? Uh, just yes. uh, not my entire desktop, right? Just yes, the yes. one PDF file. Okay, so uh, is will you be seeing me simultaneously or uh, you... no, sir? No, we can see only your screen, not uh, your if you video. Uh, if if you can use another device, then probably we can see you. I see. Okay, yeah. maybe uh, let's just go with this because I don't. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, let's I go think with this. Can, yeah. Yeah. We can okay. see you at the end of the talk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So okay, so uh, you see my uh, just one slide now, or do you see one and a half slides? No, one. we can see your complete slide. OK, it's a full screen, right? Yes. yes. OK, perfect. Perfect. Well, OK, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It's it's a really a great pleasure to be here at this All India meeting. Um, and yeah, so I'll get started since in the interest of time, we, we don't have much time. So I'm going to be talking about categorical picard Lefschetz theory, uh, which is the categorification of the usual picard Lefschetz theory. And everything I say today will be based on joint work with Ludmil Kazakov and Ted Spade. Um, and uh, has appeared in our paper, Kalabi of Structures, Spherical Functors, and Shifted Symplectic Structures, uh, which was published this year. Okay, here's an outline of my talk. I'll begin with a review, uh, a very quick review, just a sort of cursory review of what uh, picard lefschetz theory is. Then I'll talk about uh, categorical geometry. And then I'll explain how picard lefschetz theory has a categorical analog where spaces are replaced by categories. So let's begin with picard lefschetz theory. So this goes back to Lefschetz from the early 1900s. And this picture sort of summarizes the main idea of picard lefschetz theory. So on the right, I have a, a map X uh, mapping to C by a holomorphic map W. Uh, X is going to be some complex analytic space, or uh, you can think of it as a complex manifold for this talk. And, um, on the on the left hand side of the picture we, uh, of this of the slide we have a picture which depicts this map so the the base is the complex plane 
And uh, on, on top, I've shown two fibers of uh, this map X, or sorry, of this map W, which I have uh, drawn as tori, but in general, you can you know, imagine much more complicated spaces, uh, spaces. So you want to think of these tori as some sort of elliptic curves. And um, so the idea is that picard lefschetz theory is some sort of um, complex analog of Morse theory, where we try to understand the shape of the space X by understanding the critical values of this function W, which is a sort of complex Morse function. And um, so you see in this picture that one of my fibers is a singular fiber. That's the fiber sitting over the X in the base in orange. Uh, so the X indicates a critical value. And all the other points in this picture I've shown are, are sort of um, non-critical values. So the fibers are smooth. And you also see that you, you, if you look at the, at the smooth fiber, you have various cycles in it. Uh, homology cycles for now. Later, there will be Lagrangian submanifolds. But now you have these homology cycles. And these cycles, um, so some of them, when you move to a singular point, uh, get collapsed into a single point. So uh, a cycle that gets collapsed to uh, when you move to the singular point is called a vanishing cycle at that point. And uh, the cycles in the smooth fiber, uh, which are close to a given singular fiber, are the nearby cycles which are marked in pink in this in, in this picture. So you see the vanishing cycle is a kind of, uh, is the blue object, which is a, you can think of as a thimble, uh, sometimes called a thimble. Okay, so this picture is what I want to have in mind for the whole of the talk. And I'm going to describe a categorical version of this story, of this picture. So if you have a, a vibration X uh, mapping to uh, the complex line, um, oops, sorry, something happened to my screen. I have to go back to my full screen. I don't know what happened. Uh, oh, there am I? Yeah. If you have a vibration, uh, as, as, as I have on the previous slide, then you can look at the neighborhood of, of a critical value, and that's a small disk, uh, disk in the complex plane, which is stratified by one point, which is at the origin of that disk, right? The, the x is at the origin of the disk. And so uh, if you ask what structure do the vanishing cycles and the nearby cycles give you on this disk, they give you the structure of a perverse sheaf on this disk with respect to the stratification. And there's a theorem uh, which goes back to the 19, I think in 1980s or something, um, which says that perverse sheaves on the disk are characterized by giving two vector spaces V and N and uh, maps from U, uh, V to N and N to V, which I've denoted U and V, uh, such that the identity minus U times V and the identity minus V times U are invertible. So that's a pure linear algebra characterization of what it means to give a perverse sheaf on the disk with respect to the stratification. So uh, the V are the vanishing cycles. Oops, and sorry, the, the N are the nearby cycles. Uh, I wrote V by mistake. Okay. So, so that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be trying to take this picture from, from classical picard lefschetz theory and describe a categorical version of this. So I'm going to tell you next about what categorical geometry is and why we should think, or, you know, why should we care about this categorification? So categorical geometry comes from trying to understand spaces, and particularly Kähler spaces, by understanding how strings propagate in them, quantum mechanical strings propagate in them, and uh, governed by the laws of, uh, you know, string theory, by, by the laws of quantum mechanics. But I'm just going to tell you, draw some pictures and tell you what structure you get when you study what's called the topological string. And that's shown in this picture. So you have uh, the, the space of states of the string <clears> is, some, is some vector space. And that, that vector space, it turns out, acquires the structure of a cochain complex. So I'm not going to explain why, but you have a cochain complex, which is the cochain complex of states of my, of my string. And uh, you see that by understanding how two strings can interact and produce one string as an output, as shown in the picture, you get a multiplication, a map from V tensor V to V, which is... Um, uh, you know, you can think of as a multiplication on uh, on the on, on the states of of, of this of the string. Uh, but you also get, if you think about it a little carefully, you also get a multiplication for three strings interacting and so on. And the fact that the two pictures above are equivalent says that this operation M three, which corresponds to three strings coming together, satisfies this rule that if you plug in M two of M two tensor identity, which is the, what's shown on the left side, hand side of the picture and subtract M2 of identity tensor M2, which is shown on the right-hand side of the picture, that is the boundary of some element in the, in the chain complex Horm V tensor 3 to V shifted minus 1, namely M3 itself. Okay. 
So, so uh, this what does it say? It says that this multiplication M2 is associative up to homotopy. But in fact, you get a whole sequence of higher homotopies because you can look at interactions of n strings at one time. So that's a map from V tensored n times to V shifted by two minus n. And uh, you get this infinite sequence of maps, mn, one for every n. And they satisfy, I mean, just as I showed you one of the equations, they satisfy. There's in fact an infinite tower of equations they satisfy. For every n, you get an equation, which is the one I've written down. It's a quadratic equation. And that's the equation at the bottom of the of this slide. So a structure like this is called an A-infinity algebra. And it was discovered by Stasheff in the 1960s when he was studying loop spaces of topological spaces. So there are various special cases of uh, what an A infinity algebra is. If you look at the case uh, where mn is 0 for all n not equal to 2, you get the usual notion of an associative algebra. And if you look at the case where mn is 0 for all n not equal to 1 or 2, you get what's called a differential graded algebra. Uh, there's also a geometric interpretation of this. If you choose linear coordinates x1, xn, and so on, on v shifted by 1, then uh, you can form the non-commutative formal power series ring in these variables. And the A infinity structure is nothing but a, a derivation on, on the space of on this ring of functions, which is of degree 1 and satisfies the equation q bracket q is 0. The Lie bracket of this vector field with itself is 0. Um, I should have written curved A infinity algebra. If I want non-curved infinity algebras, I should put the additional condition that q at the point 0 is equal to 0. q vanishes at the origin. Anyway, so there's a geometric interpretation of this. Um, now let's uh, look at what happens. Well, the strings were propagating with their boundaries on, on this uh, cycle E that I'd shown earlier. But you could have more than one cycle that you think of in your space. And the boundary condition could be that the string has one end on, on E0 and another end on the cycle E1. So in general, if you have many boundary conditions, E0, E1, E2, and so on, then for every pair E0 and E1, you should have a cochain complex, which is the space of states of a string with endpoints on E0 and E1, and uh, of a topological string with, uh, with these boundary conditions. And then you have a multiplication map, which goes from uh, C of E1, E2, tends to C of E0, E1, to C of E0, E2, and so on. Right? Um, it's just the same as before, except that now I have non-trivial, you know, I, I allow my boundary conditions for the left hand and right hand end of the string to be different. So in general, an A-infinity category is essentially the same thing as an A-infinity algebra, except that you have many boundary conditions. So you have a set of objects, uh, ob C. You have graded vector spaces C, E, E prime for all objects E and E prime. And for any sequence of N objects, you have these linear maps Mn, which satisfy the same equations as before, as for an A-infinity algebra. So here are some examples of how you get these infinity categories. One comes from starting with a symplectic manifold. So re uh, recall that a symplectic manifold is a 2n dimensional manifold equipped with a closed two form, which is non-degenerate, which means that omega of any vector field, comma blank, is an isomorphism of the tangent bundle with the cotangent bundle. Right? So omega at each point is a non-degenerate bilinear form. Um, so that's what a symplectic manifold is. And if you have a symplectic manifold, you can construct an A-infinity category out of it, whose objects are Lagrangian submanifolds of M. Um, and the, uh, a submanifold is Lagrangian if the symplectic form restricted to L is 0, and L is of half the dimension of M. So the A-model A-infinity category, which is called the Fukai category, and was uh, defined by, you know, uh, well, the, 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 there's a thousand page book that goes to giving this definition by Fukaya, O, Ono, and Ota. And there are various sh shorter definitions you can give uh, if you make various assumptions on the symplectic manifold. And a lot of work nowadays is about trying to find uh, conceptual definitions of the Fukaya category, which will be shorter and cleaner. And so now we have shorter definitions. But uh, anyway, this definition of the Fukaya category goes back to work of uh, Floor. Uh, on infinite dimensional Morse theory, which is called floor theory. Uh, Donaldson, Fukai, and Konsevich from the 1980s and 19, uh, early 90s and so on. So that's how far back it goes. And uh, so what is this A-infinity category? The objects of this A-infinity category are decorated Lagrangian submanifolds of my symplectic manifold M. Um, so I won't tell you what the decorations are. You can just think of them as Lagrangian submanifolds. And for every pair of Lagrangians, L1 and L2, you have the floor complex 
which is generated by the intersection points of L1 and L2. Um, and um, the MNs are given by counting, counting pseudo-homorphic disks with boundaries on these uh, submanifolds L1, L2, and so on, all the way up to LN. Okay, so uh, it's something geometric. So there's a generalization called the Fukaya Saido category, which you can associate to a pair consisting uh, of a, uh, you know, what we started with at the beginning of this talk, which is a holomorphic function of, on a complex manifold. And the objects in this are basically those Lagrangian vanishing cycles that I drew. They are vanishing cycles, which are in addition Lagrangian submanifolds. And the morphisms are again given by Lagrangian floor cohomology. There's also um, an A infinity category you can construct from a complex manifold instead of a symplectic manifold, and that's called the derived category of coherent sheaves. And the objects in this category are bounded complexes of holomorphic vector bundles. Right? So they're basically uh, chain complexes uh, of, you know, of complex vector spaces at each point of my complex manifold, which vary holomorphically as I move across the complex manifold. Very roughly, that's what the objects are in, in, in this B model category. And the reason why we, are, we care about these A infinity categories and want to think of them as spaces is because there's a deep relation between complex geometry and symplectic geometry called mirror symmetry, which interchanges the roles of the derived category of coherent sheaves and the Fukai category. So a pair of manifolds is called mirror, a pair of Kähler manifolds is called mirror, if the derived category of coherent sheaves on the first manifold is equivalent to the Fukaya category of the second manifold. Okay. So, um, and there's a very long, uh, you know, a, a deep program in mathematics called homological mirror symmetry, which aims to understand this, this duality, this phenomenon that um, Kähler manifolds seem to occur in pairs where the role of symplectic geometry and um, complex geometry is interchanged in such a way that the, a, the B model category uh, of the first space is equivalent to the A model category of the second space and vice versa. So this was proposed by Konsevich in the 19, uh, mid 1990s uh, to explain various conjectures coming out of string theory, which were very surprising to mathematicians. So that's the background for this. Okay, so with that background, let's move on to categorical picard lefschetz theory. So now I want to think of A infinity categories as being non-commutative spaces. And I want to study this, uh, the situation that I had before the same old uh, picture that I had in the first slide, which is this holomorphic function um, defined on a complex manifold. Uh, but I want to study it by replacing the fibers of this vibration by A infinity categories. So the smooth fibers will be replaced by the Fukaya categories, and the singular fibers will be replaced by the Fukaya sidle categories of a small neighborhood of that point, of that singular fiber. So this idea was uh, the idea that you should study these vibrations by replacing the spaces by infinity categories was proposed by Konsevich uh, in the 2000s. So, so, so the question then becomes, what is the categorification of perverse sheaves on the unit disk? Right? So earlier we had these vanishing cycles which formed a vector space and the nearby cycles which also formed a vector space. And we wanna ask, um, you know, do these arise as some invariants of some spaces, of some non-commutative spaces where a non-commutative space is an A infinity category. So this definition is just a categorification of the characterization of perverse sheaves that I gave in the second slide. We, the definition says that, uh, oops, sorry, uh, I, have, I have written it wrong here. It should be the definition says a spherical functor, the title of the side is spherical functors. So a spherical functor is given by a tuple V, N, phi, and psi, where V and N are triangulated A infinity categories. I haven't defined what triangulated is, but, uh, I don't have the time. Uh, and you're given a pair of functors with psi being the right adjoint of phi, such that the, the cone of the map from the identity to psi composed with phi, which is the unit of the adjunction, the cone of the unit of the adjunction and the, the cone of the co-unit of the adjunction are invertible functors. Uh, the parenthesis should be on the outside of uh, the, the cone on, at the bottom. It should be after the identity. I apologize for the error. Uh, this is two typos in this slide. Okay, so that's what a spherical functor is, and it's the categorification of what a perverse sheaf on the disk is. Um, so a perverse Schober is a globalization of this. So uh, the idea is that you, you a perverse Schober on C, on the complex line, is given by specifying a finite set of points, which are called the critical values, if you like, uh, P1 through PK and C. A collection of triangulated A infinity categories, X1 through XK, associated to those critical values, and a triangulated A infinity category Y associated to the smooth, uh, the, the smooth locus. 
and spherical functors phi i from these categories x i to the category y. In particular, if you're given a Landau-Ginzburg model that is a holomorphic function, a w from x to c, then you get a Schober on the complex plane where the x i's, the script x i's, are the Foucault sidal categories of the, of the singular fibers. And, the, and y is the Foucault category uh, of the smooth fiber. So this definition, uh, which is a definition sketch, really not a proper definition uh, that I've given here, uh, the proper def the, the complete definition is given in a paper of Kapranov and Schekman from 2014, inspired by the idea of Konsevich that I just described. So here's a picture of what a perverse Schober might look like. Uh, you're given the complex line, and you have um, these critical points in the base, P1 through PK. I've drawn three of them. Um, and over each critical point, you have a category, which is a, the, if you like, critical category associated with the, to that point. And over a smooth point, you put a copy of Y. Um, and so this is the data of a perverse Schober. And the white arrows from Y to X size are the spherical functors. The green loop around the uh, singular values is the monodromy, which plays an important role in classical uh, picard lefschetz theory. And here you should have a categorical analog of monodromy, which you can define purely by starting with these uh, spherical functors. So this, in the definition of spherical functor, you have this cone of the identity mapping to psi composed with phi, and those play the role, these autoequivalences, these invertible autoequivalences of VNN, they play the role of, um, of the monodromy in classical picard lefschetz theory. Great. So, um, so this is what a perverse Schober is. And I've also drawn a graph in the base. And uh, that graph um, is, is there for a reason, because using the graph, you can construct a global category out of the Ys and the Xis, the script Xis, uh, as follows. So you define a sheaf of categories on the graph, on the orange graph. By At a smooth point, you simply put a copy of the category Y. At one of the X points, um, the critical values, you put a copy of the category Xi. And at an internal vertex of the graph, you put Y tensored with representations of A n minus one, where n is the valency of that, of that, of that internal vertex. Okay? So this gives a sheaf of categories on the graph. And the global sections of the sheaf of categories is what you call the Fukaya category of the Schober, the Fukaya category of this diagram of categories. And morally, this, I mean, this is a conjecture. I mean, conjecturally, this, uh, this construction should recover the Fukaya category of the uh, total space X in cases where this Schober arose from geometry by the process I described earlier. Right? So it's supposed to recover the Fukaya category. So now I come to the last slide. Uh, and I think that's good timing because we're uh, about to finish my the talk time for my talk. So, uh, so in our work, what we did is we showed that we, you can generalize many ideas from classical picard lefschetz theory to this, to this uh, setting, the setting of perverse Schobers. Um, in particular, we could understand monodromy and its relation to self uh, monodromy in terms of self functors. That's a rough sort of description of what we did, and that allowed us to show. Uh, that giving a, a spherical functor is really the same thing as giving what's called a weak relative Calabi-Yau structure on the functor from on any functor from x to y. So that's the first result. That a weak relative Calabi-Yau structure is the same thing as something called a compatible spherical functor. I didn't tell you what compatibility is, uh, but there's not enough time. It's technical, and there isn't enough time. So the, that's the first result. Uh, the second result is that if you give a weak relative Calabi-Yau structure on a perverse Schober, which means essentially giving a relative Calabi-Yau structure on each of those functors phi i, which define the Schober, then you get a uh, Calabi-Yau structure on the global sections of this, on the Foucault theoretic global sections, which are described in words of the Schober. Okay, so this is a local to global principle um, for constructing Calabi-Yau structures on on uh, Foucault categories, basically. It tells you that if you have Calabi-Yau structures on the fibers of this uh, family of categories uh, defined by the Landau-Ginzburg model, then you get a Calabi-Yau structure on the global on the global Foucault category. And this is a sort of proof of concept for a, a prototype for the type of local to global results you want to prove for all sorts of structures, um, not just Calabi-Yau structures, but for example, stability conditions uh, on Foucault type categories. And you know that has a lot of implications for higher type theory and various 
areas, but that currently is something, a long-term project that is not you know, immediately within reach. So, so proving the same result for stability conditions would be a very, uh, you know, uh, would imply a lot of uh, deep results in various areas of geometry, in particular in higher type theory. Really. And finally, uh, there's a class of results we proved that using these Kalabiyao structures on perverse showbers, you can, uh, you know, there's a general principle that if you have a Kalabiyao structure on, on a category, it gives rise to a shifted symplectic structure, a derived symplectic structure on the moduli spaces of objects in the category. And um, we proved a number of results of this type showing that you can construct shifted symplectic structures on moduli spaces of objects and categories using the previous result that I just mentioned, the existence of these Kalabiyao structures on the global sections of uh, the show book. So, that is, uh, so that's all I have to say. Uh, thanks for listening. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pranav, uh, for this uh, very uh, nice talk. So is there any question from the audience? Anyone has any Thank question? you for having me, uh, Krishnandu. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I was just trying yeah, to. Yeah, so you can you can switch on your camera now so that. Uh, yeah, it's on, I think, but I don't see. Oh, oops, yeah. Okay, now it's fine. So I have a quick question. Maybe uh, I do not know whether it makes sense to ask here. So normally, the classically, this uh, left stage uh, theory, uh, the one which you were speaking, the Picard left stage theory. Okay, yeah. so that was uh, developed to solve the so called while conjecture in number theory. Right. right. So, 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 right. is there a categorical uh, version of that conjecture that you are trying to uh, apply your uh, construction? The, that's a good question. I mean, I have we haven't yet uh, thought about trying to apply it in that direction, in arithmetic directions. But uh, yeah. so we were more motivated by mirror symmetry and geometry. Uh, okay. Like by geometry, I mean uh, not arithmetic geometry, but uh, sort of usual. Um, you know, geometry over the complex geometry. numbers and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but that's a great question. In fact, there are like non-commutative analogs of you know the left shift trace formula and and things like that, uh, which yeah. were used to prove uh, the uh, you know the way conjectures. So it's a yeah, it's a great question. I mean, can we apply this to arithmetic categories? Is something that we haven't thought about yet. But I think that's a, a you know something that you know, once the technology once this framework is developed further, it would be very interesting to apply it. Um, also in arithmetic directions, but at the moment it's the foundations are still being developed, so we are at that stage of you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. But yeah, but thanks. That's a that's a great question. Yeah, I think thank you, Pranav. Yeah. So so if there is no more questions, let's thank the speaker. Uh, I yeah. So I thank, thank you. you. Thank, <laughs> thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry about the background noise. Uh, unfortunately, no, no, it's, fine. it's a Sunday and I'm traveling. I hope it was audible. I hope I was audible. Oh, it was perfectly audible. It's yeah. perfectly audible. Okay, great. Oh, okay. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. So maybe uh, we can invite our next speaker after Pranav, uh, which is uh, Dr. Pralai Chatterjee from IMSC Bangalore. So Pralai, are you here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Can, are you, am I audible? You are audible, but even, yeah, I can see. Uh, where is your camera? Uh, are, you, ah, are you? Moment, so. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you now. Great. Yeah. Okay, so you can share your screen. Yeah, so can I, maybe I'll, so, okay. I'll, let me see. This is something new to me, so I'll share my screen. Just a sec. Next to the mic, there is a arrow. Oh. So Dr. Chatterjee is probably using two devices, so it depends. Yeah. So we can see your screen. No problem. You can see yes. my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. And, and I am audible also, right? You are yes. audible. You are very well audible as well as visible. Perfect. Visible. All right. So we can even see your coffee, which you drank. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. So let's me try to. Yeah, so I'll make it full screen. OK. All right, so uh, I'm my I'm good. I, I uh, of course I should thank the organizer and. Yeah, so just to, uh, let me introduce you. So let's welcome Professor Pralai Chatterjee from uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences uh, in Chennai. So Professor Chatterjee uh, 
finished his PhD under Professor Dani from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in 2002. After that, he was a postdoc at Oklahoma State University. Or Oklahoma Hello. Uh, sir, you are voice. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Pralay, sir, you are audible. Yeah, so uh, can I so, start? Pralaya, you can, uh, yeah, you can start. You can start. Absolutely. Yeah, so I should uh, I should thank the organizer and especially Professor Krishnendu Gangopadhyay for, for the invitation. So uh, I'm going to talk on a on uh, my topic is lower dimensional cohomologies of homogeneous spaces of Lie groups. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, Indranil Biswas and my student, uh, ex-student Chandan Maiti, who is in Aisar Mohali and Indranil Biswas is from TIFR Mumbai. So, so as the title suggests that I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, computing cohomologies of homogeneous spaces, but uh, let me try to motivate what uh, sort of uh, led us uh, considering this question. So uh, initially it started with uh, uh, something called a constant uh, Krilov form, which is, uh, uh, is a closed form, non-degenerate two form on orbits of uh, some simple Lie groups on its Lie algebra. So and so, this form is uh, closed, non-degenerate. So yeah, every orbit has a symplectic structure. So so we gave uh, Biswas, Indranil, and Indranil Biswas and uh, myself we uh, gave a exactness criteria criteria for this form to be uh, closed, uh, exact. Sorry, exact, and uh, for a large class of semi-simple groups, and uh, so this is a two-form. So this sort of uh, asked us to see that uh, what should be the cohomology, second full second cohomology group of such orbits. So we tried to see if some something is known on this, but uh, we found out that uh, we don't know anything on this. So that's that's how we started the. Uh, uh, this question. So we wanted to like have a, a clean formula for uh, second cohomology group. So it my spaces are of this form G mod H. So all orbits are of this form G mod H. So we wanted to have a formula for the uh, second cohomology of uh, G mod H involving uh, the data associated to G and how H is uh, embedded in G. But uh, even that was uh, not uh, there in the literature. So we uh, we sort of derived a formula uh, for this. But before uh, we go on uh, elaborating more on this, we should say that uh, there is a result of Mosto which says that uh, for a general homogeneous space, the, I can, we can transfer the problem from a general homogeneous space to a uh, compact homogeneous space. Because for a large class of uh, homogeneous spaces of Lie groups, so let me just say the theorem of Mosto. So L is a connected Lie group and M is a closed subgroup with finitely many connected components. So this finitely many connected component is an important assumption. And let G be a maximal compact subgroup of L. And we assume that H, which is the intersection of G and M, is a maximal compact subgroup of uh, uh, M. Then L, L by M, the homogeneous space, the compact homogeneous space L by M, is sitting inside uh, the non possibly non-compact homogeneous space G mod H as a deformation retract. So, uh, so this theorem actually was uh, proved by Mosto for uh, when L is connected, oh sorry, uh, M is connected, 
But you know, the same proof goes through when uh, uh, AIM, is, AIM has finitely many connected components. OK. So I'll still call it. Uh, so it, it, it's 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 the there is no change in the proof. So. So this reduces the problem of uh, looking at uh, for a general homogeneous spaces of a connected Lie group to a compact one with 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 minor like you know conditions like uh, the stabilizer of the orbit should have finitely many uh, stabilizer of any orbit in a point should have finitely many. So, so yeah, so this says that we can, uh, as I said, that uh, this is a deformation retract. So H i of m by m of all the cohomologies are same. So now using we can use this uh, and so to reduce the problem to the compact ones. Now for a compactly group, we have uh, in our uh, recent work uh, with uh, Biswas, uh, Maithi and myself, uh, we have derived a clean formula for any compact homogeneous space with uh, arbitrary homogeneous space. So if L is a connected uh, compact Lie group and uh, or you can say, OK, so one can say in terms of uh, maximal compact. So if H is a uh, maximal compact, so yeah, so I can assume that L is a connected Lie group, M is a closed subgroup, finitely many connected components, and H is a maximal compact subgroup of M, and G is a maximal compact subgroup of L. Then, you know, we have this uh, H2 of L by M is basically uh, isomorphic to this vector space. So I consider the center of uh, the Lie subalgebra of the, so all these uh, German uh, letters are Lie, Lie algebras corresponding to the Lie groups. So Z H is the center of the Lie algebra, and I intersect with the commutator of uh, the Lie algebra G G, and uh, H acts on it uh, by uh, adjoint representation on the space, and H naught. You see, H naught acts on this space trivially because uh, H naught is a connected group. And on, on center of the Lie algebra tax trivially, so the action of H factors through H H naught. I have uh, action of the finite group H by H naught on the space, so H two L by M R is isomorphic to this space, and this is the wedge two of G by uh, G G plus H star. So it is uh, two forms on the space G by this space. So. In many, many cases, uh, if we take G to be semi-simple, this, this thing vanishes this way. G by G, G plus H vanishes because G is equal to G, G if G is semi-simple. So uh, in very special situation, you might obtain uh, much more clean formulas than this. So this is a very general formula which was uh, not there. So using this, I mean, this formula turned out to be extremely useful in our computation. So we like you know and there is a analogous formula for uh, h1 also so using this uh, we have uh, computed uh, so just to tell you uh, where we have used this so uh, we have a theorem by indril and myself uh, which started this game. so we took a complex semi simple algebra and i take this sp2 and g2 uh, this uh, some few uh, uh, exceptional ones, so G2F4, E7, E8. And if I take a nilpotent element, then uh, we have found our, we have proved using this formula that uh, H2, like H2 vanishes for any, any nilpotent orbit. So, and in fact, we could compute the H2 of any complex, uh, for a complex uh, semi simple Lie algebra, we could compute H2 of any nilpotent orbit. So, this is actually a corollary of what we have uh, done. So our next result where we have applied this uh, result, this previous theorem is the following one. If this is our recent work with uh, Biswas uh, and Maithi. And we have uh, just um, we are just giving a sample of uh, the results. So we have computed the second cohomology groups of nilpotent orbits in all the classical real Lie groups. So which are sim uh, simple Lie groups. And 
previously it was all done for complex lie groups and now we have done for all the real forms of the complex lie groups which was much more intricate and in fact in c in biswas and chatterjee's work uh, you know, my, myself and biswas's work we have obtained a formula in the this formula uh, for in a restrictive situation actually this bcm this theorem actually generalizes our previous work so and this previous theorem of b uh, biswas and myself was not uh, applicable in this uh, in this setting in this setting of uh, real forms of uh, complex semi simple lie algebras so simple lie algebras so we have to get a really a general formula for this so this along with uh, so this all of course this was uh, a theorem which used uh, this cohomology computation of uh, the work which uh, which i've just now told but this also involves a uh, very computational uh, some of the involved computation uh, which is, which tells us how the maximal compact is embedded inside the ambient group so that is very important so the you, you, if you look at this paper you will see that a lot of computations are there so 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 this sort of led us to ask uh, can we can we give a simple description of higher cohomologies not just uh, why to stop at two if i give you a lie group g and a uh, compact lie group g and a uh, compact subgroup connected compact lie group g and a compact subgroup h not necessarily connected uh, can one just write down the let's say betty number of this of uh, or let's say uh, can one give a simple formula for the cohomology the, the way we have given in for h2 so that was our question so but it turns out that you know the there are works but there are generality general formulas and so on but uh, it's uh, as far as computations are uh, computability is concerned this is not really uh, the none of them are useful so so then we started looking at the problem and then uh, we could we could uh, get some like explicit formulas for h3 and h4 and this is what the purpose of this talk but before that let me just tell you what is the gener general uh, generalities or ge what are the uh, some of the old works which are interesting so so i start with uh, again a con connected compact lie group and also a compact uh, lie group and h a closed subgroup and we have this uh, 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 differential algebras of uh, forms uh, on the lie algebra and i take this uh, uh, differential on the forms which is given by the last formula here and these are all standard but uh, now this is something very standard fact which is even there in spivak's book that if i take a compact connected lie group and a cold closed subgroup then uh, connectedness is important then it start the cohomology is actually cohomology of the pair of the lie algebra that is forms which uh, vanish on h that means if i take n form i take the complex of n forms which is uh, add h invariant and if i substitute in in, in any variable if i put any uh, a value from h then it it gives me zero i take all such forms and apply this dg that gives me a subcomplex of the complex of the uh, complex of uh, forms and if i take the cohomology uh, in the lie algebra setting of this relative uh, of this cohomology of this pair then i get uh, the cohomology of the lie algebra so these are all generalities so but uh, these generalities like you know sometime it helps but in most of the time uh, in when in our situation it didn't help much so and for when h is disconnected we have uh, a formula which is uh, appearing below which is also easy to derive so this is the first step in the this is the first norm step which is which, which has been like known to us for many years which is something very standard but uh, using this but uh, 
so this this we are going to use this later on but let me just say what is known i mean i am not saying going to like give an elaborate history of this but i'll just uh, you can choose some of the highlights of this uh, old results so of course there is a famous work by arma borel uh, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of work by him but one of his theorem is the following which says that if G is a compact connected Lie group and H is a closed subgroup, connected closed subgroup and rank of G, and they are supposed to be equi rank. That means uh, a maximal torus in G, H is a maximal torus in G. So in that situation, one can really give a formula for the point correct polynomial of G mod H, which is given by uh, this uh, result. So it gives all the betting numbers. So, but there is a strong condition here. You see the rank of G is rank of H. And in our situation in the nilpotent orbit case, there is uh, this kind of result is not of, uh, of any use because uh, uh, we don't have equi-rank situation. So uh, this is, of course, uh, it can be applied in a different context much nicely, but things are not uh, so, uh, things may not be equi-rank, okay? Uh, so now uh, let's look at another interest, very interesting result, which is a result by Wang. There are many, I'm just giving you some idea of what is known, what are the nice results known. So again, this is a, uh, the result is actually useful in the, so it, you take a compact and Lie group and suppose I have a closed subgroup. And then uh, if the rank is strictly greater than the rank, rank of G is strictly greater than the rank of H, then the Euler characteristic of G mod H is zero. In fact, it is a even only condition. Now, in the equivalent case, then Wang gives a clear formula for the Euler characteristic. So if I rank G is rank of H, then one can easily show that the wild group, so wild group is normalizer of the torus by the torus. And so wild group, if the rank, in the equivalent situation, wild group of H sits inside while group of G. So uh, the order of the while group divides, while group of H divides the while group of G. So, and in this case, the Euler characteristic is given by, so if I have equivalent situation, the Euler characteristic is given by the uh, order of the while group of the bigger one divided by the uh, order of the while group of the smaller one. So this is another very, very interesting result. Again, so of course, I mean, this 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 is this can be applicable in all situation because in the non equivalent case it is it gives us zero. Okay, so now uh, apart from this general description which I have given here, which can be easily proved using like you know when a connected group, a connected compact group acts on a manifold, one can give uh, the cohomology of the compact compactness in born and compactness of the group G invariant form is same as. Uh, uh, gene variant cohomologies. So using that, you can one can easily uh, get this PVAX, whatever result that PVAX says is a standard result. But this is uh, is not much of help, uh, not of much help. But the kind of result which helped us uh, doing the computation is the following, which is uh, uh, so I'm, I'm I see that I'm running out of time, so I just. Uh, uh, not get into technical details. So let me just say that uh, this is a result of Karta. So uh, Karta gave a different way of computing the cohomologies of homogeneous spaces. So, so, so if I have a cohomology, uh, so uh, yeah. So you see. <sighs> Yeah, so this is kind of little technical. So he gives an alternating way, which is which is really useful. Also, not uh, useful to the extent that it can give you formulas like we did. Uh, but it is it is this is the one we this became very helpful in our uh, com in our computation. So uh, so let me just say that you know. Let me just roughly say I need the concept of primitive forms. So if I have a compact Lie groups, primitive forms are very useful because primitive Go forms, they give us the cohomology of the compact Lie group. Uh, and 
a primitive form in roughly it is something which is prime which is cannot be further decomposed so but i am just uh, being vague here so because i am vague because i have no time uh, to give the precise definition so i'll uh, say that uh, there is something uh, called a kozul complex uh, so which is uh, written in this blue color so if i have a lie group G, h inside the lie group g then i have this uh, symmetric uh, s h star is the symmetric n linear forms the algebra of symmetric n linear forms and to the power h means their h invariant symmetric uh, n linear forms and on the other side i have the wedge of the spaces of primitive forms and i have a so this gives a complex okay and this delta uh, this nabla sigma is uh, a differential map which is obtained by another gadget obtained using another gadget called a transgression and so cohomology of this object is same as the cohomology of g mod h when h is connected this is what cartan's result was and you see uh, the component from sh one can uh, one can give a, a sort of uh, vague idea why this sh is there because uh, g is a h principal bundle over g mod h so and i have this uh, sh the invariant poly h invariant polynomials to the cohomology of g mod h this is the chan while homomorphism so this comes from this so i'm not going to elaborate on this because you see this is technical and it is uh, my i'm i'm uh, my time is very short so so basically i am given a complex a different kind of complex using which if i compute the cohomologies i get back g mod h and that turn this particular complex which is this kozul complex is turns out to be extremely useful in computing the cohomology so so i'm if you uh, recall that uh, uh, if i if i write down the first few terms it is going to be like this and one can really write down explicit formulas for this uh, derivative maps at every level and did be, did this became useful to us so but uh, not just this so now karta gave this formula for h connected now the first steps is to extend karta's result to disconnected h so this is what we have done first and that came out uh, yeah so this came out nicely so if you are in this situation uh, that if i have a lie group and a closed subgroup and if i have gamma in odd g uh, which is keeping h invariant and suppose i have a h and suppose i have a so the, okay so let let me not, not just elaborate on this so basically i should say that when h is disconnected uh, then also i have a similar result like karta and yeah so this is this is the result which actually was used in our computation so now if i use this computation then uh, let me just say what our result is so h3 if i take a connected lie group and m is a closed subgroup and is a max it it's given in maximal compact because of post result we can reduce to maximal compact so g is a maximal compact subgroup of l and h is a maximal compact subgroup of m which is like this satisfying the inclusion of h inside g and r zero is the dimension of this then h3 is given by this clean formula and similarly h4 is given by this now there are two unknown objects here one is this ngh and another is cg capital h the first one is ngh which depends on the lie algebra g and h and the second one is cgh which depends on the lie algebra of g but the group h the group of group h did not be connected that is why we have to uh, uh, get the group h here so let me just say what this ngh and cgh are and one can see that they can be computed using the data related to g and h directly so if i have a compact connected lie group and h is a closed subgroup and r is the number of uh, simple factors in the semi simple lie algebra gg and let uh, 
Let gi be the simple factors. I r runs from one to r in G G, and I am considering the killing forms B I on on all this G I, and I extend this to G by uh, putting on other factors orthogonal. Uh, so I'm getting a gene a uh, gene variant form, and now I give a map from this R to the power R to this uh, this following map, and S H intersection G G star is basically all the symmetric uh, n linear. I mean symmetric the algebra of symmetric forms, and if I take there in H invariant forms, then uh, R to the power R to this I have a map. And NGH is the kernel of this map, and CGH is the co-kernel of this map. And as you see, that uh, all the data are easily like obtainable from the data involving G and H. So, uh, for I mean, for all practical purpose, one can really uh, I mean, in many situations, if you just happen to know how things are inside, then you can, can compute this H3 and H4. So let me just say a, a few applications of this. This is um, applications are always more sometimes uh, more interesting to know than the actual theorems. So here we have a theorem which says that H3 L by M is actually uh, there is a this gives us a bound. If uh, L is a compact connected Lie group, and suppose L and M naught are both semi simple Lie groups, compact semi simple Lie groups. Then uh, we have the bound for the H3, which is the number of simple factors of L, and the number of H4 is bounded by the number of simple factors of M. And the difference, the interesting thing is the difference is the difference of the number of simple factors of M and the number of simple factors of L. Okay, so that's the that's the so that that's in, invariant of the homogeneous space, and this says that uh, yeah. So if these are homotopically invariant, then these numbers are difference of these numbers are same. So and uh, if you have such numbers unequal, then these spaces cannot be homotopically given. So now uh, the last thing is, I mean, there is an in, Yet another interesting corollary, which was uh, so suppose I have a, a some simple compact group and close subgroup, and suppose uh, I have the dimension of L by M is seven, then the number of simple factors uh, is uh, same as the number of simple factors of M. Yeah, so uh, this theorem also was uh, proved by the classification of uh, Seven dimensional compact homogeneous spaces by Gorbat Savage, but our proofs is also, I mean, gives an easy, easy consequence of what we have shown. So, yeah, so I end here with a few references. Here is the, you see, uh, uh, there are results, references like this. So, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you, Pranada, for this uh, very nice talk. So, is there any question? Any question? So, Pranada, I have a quick question. Yeah. So, you talked about uh, nilpotent orbits, uh, cohomology ring of nilpotent orbits. Okay, what about uh, semi simple? Yeah. Hello? That's the second cohomology, not the full cohomology. That's the second cohomology, yeah, yeah. What's about uh, semi-simple elements? Is it known or? Uh, yeah, semi-simple elements are easier to like, you know, do because uh, centralizer of semi-simple, these, these are in, you are in a equivalent situation. So semi centralizer of simple elements is the, it will contain a full uh, torus inside this. So, okay. So there you can possibly apply this Borel's result and so on, so. Okay. And as far as I know, you also computed third and fourth cohomology, right? I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, we gave a formula, but we, I mean, we can of course compute, but you know, 
I'll, uh, that's another story because, yeah, theoretically, I mean, we can our, our, use our uh, Kyoto paper to compute uh, third and fourth cohomology also, but, uh, but uh, the computation of third and fourth cohomologies were uh, not, uh, I mean, we, of course, we were trying to look at uh, third and fourth cohomologies, but, uh, uh, and surprisingly, it gives us the, the applications which were like, you know, we obtained uh, nice applications that was the upshot but otherwise yeah this is this gives us a formula computable formula but if we go higher then things get much more complicated because of uh, yeah somehow there are some technical points which like you know gave us uh, an advantage in computing third and fourth cohomologies but as you go higher then it, it gets really really complicated Okay, okay, so if uh, there is no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker. Uh, so let me thank Professor Pralai Chatterjee. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, Pralai. So thank you can, very much, Kishinandu, for the uh, invitation. Yeah. I thank the organizer also for their kind invitation. It was. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for coming. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Professor Gauri Shankar, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, so now uh, in the next yes. one hour, uh, Professor Gauri Shankar will be the chair of the session. He will conduct on behalf of me. And the speakers are Dr. Pranav Sardar and uh, Dr. Prasamik Basu. So both of them are here. Uh, so moderator, can you please include uh, both of them so that they can share the screen? Yes, sir. They both are the presenter. They can share their screen. Okay. So Gauri Sankar, over to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. So, uh, firstly, I am very much thankful. Hope uh, I am audible. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So, firstly, I am very much thankful to the organizers and uh, especially to my friend Professor Kishnando that uh, uh, he has invited me for chairing this session. So, so uh, first uh, uh, lecture in this series is uh, from uh, Professor Samik Basu. So let me first introduce in short, uh, Professor Basu uh, is uh, from Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata. Uh, he is PhD from Harvard University in 2009. And uh, he was also faculty at the uh, RK MVU Valur Math uh, there. And also, uh, <coughs> he has been also faculty at Institute of Cultivation of Science, Jadapur, uh, prior to joining ISI Kolkata. So uh, today uh, he is going to talk on the structure of uh, unstable homotopy groups. So over to you, Professor Basu. Samik, is everything fine? Uh, yeah, hi, hi, thank you. You are muted. Uh, please yeah. unmute yourself first. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Uh, okay, yeah, so, so, so let once me again, welcome first... uh, you in the session and uh, uh, please start. So let me start. Sharing the no. I should share the entire screen. So, uh, can you can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Yes, now it is visible. Ah, okay. So let me do full screen. I think that yes. would be. So this uh, everyone can see, I guess. Um, so I should thank uh, the organizers and especially Krishnanduda for inviting me to give this lecture. And um, I should thank uh, Professor Gauri Shankar for the kind introduction. So let me begin. The 
title of my lecture says uh, structure of unstable uh, homotopy groups so basically what i want to talk about is uh, these unstable homotopy groups and uh, I, and there is some hidden structure so first let me just uh, talk in general terms and then i will describe what uh, we are uh, what kind of result we have about these homotopy groups okay so uh, okay that's how it will work okay so you see uh, in general if i talk about uh, topology uh, so we are interested in certain uh, classes of uh, topological spaces namely either we are interested in something like complex algebraic varieties or we are interested in some some uh, easier category like smooth manifolds or we sometimes talk about topological spaces in general where we have uh, things which are not varieties which are not manifolds and everything is there so um, so the advantage here when we uh, when we are dealing with something like algebraic varieties you see the structure is very rigid on the other hand when we go to topological spaces we have a lot of flexibility so what happens is you are allowed to do a lot of constructions on the right hand side uh, there is a possibility of uh, doing a large number of constructions which allow us to study this category in a very systematic manner. And, but these constructions, when you go from the right to the left, these constructions um, are not always possible. So for example, one of the constructions is we see in our first algebraic topology course is that you can, you can start with a topological space and you can attach a disk to it along the boundary so it is uh, called the process of adding a cell to a topological space so this kind of construction in smooth manifolds there is an analogous concept of attaching handles while if you go all the way to algebraic varieties there is no analog there is really no analogous construction there so th so this is uh, what i feel is there is um, some advantage in, in talking about the category of topological spaces and studying everything from that point of view. If I want to really understand to some, if I want to really um, understand the structure of the category, it's much easier if you are going to the right hand side. So this is reflected in this um, kind of thing. So there is something called homotopy equivalence so you talk about two maps being homotopic if they are uh, if they are related by a continuous family of uh, continuous maps and something is a homotopy equivalence if uh, if you have x and y are two spaces they are called homotopy equivalent if there is a map either way and the compositions are homotopic to the identity so there is a continuous family so if you so the thing so the point here is if i can look at the category of topological spaces and i can put this relation of homotopy equivalence and then the amazing fact here is that this category here this may be understood via algebraic invariants and this is really the starting point of uh, um, algebraic topology or more specifically homotopy theory so let me just uh, so my lecture is going to be about this and uh, to point out how to uh, understand algebraic invariance in a systematic way okay so my uh, focus here is this uh, category topological spaces up to homotopy equivalence and the universal in invariant for such a thing is 
these homotopy groups. Uh, the homotopy groups of a space, pi k of x, is just described by homotopy classes of maps from the k sphere into x, which preserve the base point. And these homotopy groups uh, in one of the earlier courses in algebraic topology, you end up seeing that when you just, when, when you put k equal to zero, there is no algebraic structure. It, it's just a set with a chosen point given by the base point. When k equal to one, it becomes a group called the fundamental group. And if k is bigger than equal to two, it's an abelian group. Well, this, uh, these homotopy groups, these are uh, these objects associated to every topological space. And unfortunately, these, so these groups contain a lot of uh, information about the topological space in this um, setup. But it is very difficult to compute these groups for every topological space. So for example, even if I take the two sphere, all these homotopy groups are not known and it is um, supposed to be very difficult. So there are very few uh, systematic theorems which tell you about the homotopy groups, uh, computations of homotopy groups in large. Maybe in some examples, like you take some X and some K, you would know the homotopy group in that degree. For example, you know, pi three of S2 is Z and all so on. But the first systematic computations is perhaps, yeah, the computation of these groups are, are very difficult in general. The first systematic computations was due to uh, Sayer, for which he won the Fields Medal. This was done during his thesis. So he showed that uh, these uh, pi k of Sn, if I take the n sphere here, uh, pi k of Sn is a finite abelian group, except in these two cases, where you'd have pi n of Sn, which is isomorphic to the integers, and pi 4n minus 1 of S2n. So you, the sphere is even dimensional, and the degree here, k, is 4n minus 1. Pi, k, pi 4n minus 1 of S2n is the integers direct sum of finite abelian group. Other than these two values, they are always finite. So, so we have, uh, so if I take, so for example, uh, instead of, um, if I take the homotopy groups, these abelian groups, and if I take the tensor with the rational numbers, then it is totally known that pi n of Sn is uh, a copy of Q, pi 4n minus 1 S2n is a copy of Q, and everything else is zero. So, so there is a uh, there is a notion where instead of taking topological spaces up to homotopy equivalence, you can take topological spaces up to rational homotopy equivalence, in which the universal invariants are just the rational uh, groups. That means pi k of x tensor q, and there all the homotopy groups of spheres are known, and uh, actually. Uh, one knows that this uh, uh, topological spaces up to rational homotopy equivalence is a completely algebraic is equivalent to a completely algebraic category, which is which was again one of the important theorems in the 70s. Due to there are there are actually two models. One is involving Lie algebras due to Quillen, and the other one involves. Uh, commutative differential graded algebras, which is due to Sullivan. So, so that's what I mean, that this uh, category is uh, very uh, well studied using algebraic invariants. So there is this theorem of Sayer, which, um, which tells you systematically some result about the homotopy groups of spheres, but there, are, there aren't that many. So the next uh, level of simplification here is we have this suspension functor. Suspension functor is something which we learn in algebraic topology and the suspension of, of the nth sphere is the n plus one sphere, which uh, you would know. 
So what we do is you define the stable homotopy groups of a space as the direct limit of this pi k plus n of sigma n x and pi k plus n of sigma n x goes to pi k plus n plus 1 of sigma n plus 1 x by taking the suspension of the map. Okay, so this is uh, this is something which eases computation because once you have this, once you take these stable homotopy groups, that becomes something called a homology theory. Okay, so so there is uh, there are more systematic methods of computing these stable homotopy groups than the unstable ones, though they are still very difficult to determine. Uh, so you see the these. Uh, by definition, almost you will see that the suspension and X, they have the same stable homotopy groups shifted in dimension by one. So now instead of uh, if I want to want the answer for the spheres, you see you only have to get the answer for one particular sphere. So, OK, so what is a how do you get a systematic method? So systematic method is you suppose you have a candidate which is a candidate in the homotopy groups of the space so if you have a candidate there uh, suppose you want to say that it is uh, not homotopic to the zero map right so suppose you want to say that then uh, what do you have to do okay so so, so do you have any questions so far? I guess no. So you can you can find uh, I think no. Uh, you okay. Continue. Yeah, because I didn't couldn't hear anyone, so I don't know whether yeah. I was being audible. Okay. So anyway, no, 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 it is uh, fine. It is fine. You are you are very much very much audible. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so suppose you have an element in one of these homotopy groups. So you want to say whether it is non-zero or not. So one way of saying that it is not non-zero is you have some cohomology and you look at the induced map in cohomology and if it is non-trivial, then, uh, then the element is non-zero. So, so one way that gives us the that is an example where you, the Hof degree theorem is an example of detecting maps from SN to SN. So what happens is if you take a map from SN to SN, uh, the map, the degree of the map that is a that is defined using the induced map in from H upper n of SN. So so pi n of SN by this Hof degree theorem says that this. Uh, the pi n of Sn is isomorphic to Z, and uh, this map here is just uh, takes a homotopy class to the degree, and the degree is defined uh, using the in induced map on H upper n. So that is the that is a way of seeing all the uh, maps in this homotopy group. But you see that. If I take if if I take pi k of S n where k is not equal to n, because of the structure of the cohomology of S n, it will induce the zero map. Okay, so that is the so this step is kind of limited. If I use cohomology, this step is kind of limited. So the so we have some more advanced method. The more advanced method is that we can apply. Uh, these things called cohomology operations. So these are natural uh, operations from on the cohomology ring of spaces. And what happens is, suppose you have a map. Okay, if it, if it induces the zero map on cohomology, then you can take something called the mapping cone of the map. You can take the mapping cone of the map. So then that will give you a so if you have a map between spheres, like you say, you look at this multiplication by two, multiply this degree two map. That is something which I denote by two. So this degree two map, if you 
now take the cone of that what you get is the sus is a suspension of the of rp2 that's what you get and so then if you look at z mod 2 cohomology then there is a non trivial uh, sq1 operation there so if you know these cohomology operations you would identify it immediately that there is a non trivial sq1 operation but this is nothing special because this degree two map I could already detect on cohomology. But then the, but the idea is there and the next step is that if I look at something, this Hoff map, this Hoff map is the attaching map of the complex projective space plane, CP2. So if I take the cone of the Hoff map, then that's just a suspension uh, N of CP2. Then there is then it turns out that in that Z mod 2 cohomology, there is a non-trivial cohomology operation by this SQ2. And that shows that this map, although it induces the zero map on uh, cohomology, it is not uh, zero in homotopy because it is detected by a cohomology operation. In the cone, I get a non-trivial cohomology operation. If it was zero, the cone would have become the wedge, and there was there couldn't be any non-trivial cohomology operation. Similarly, this new map here, this is the attaching map of the quaternionic projective plane, and it is detected by this Skinrod operation SQ4. And then there is this sigma map, which is detected by SQ8. So these are some um, uh, elements in the stable homotopy groups which are detected by cohomology operations. These are all actually some version of Hoff maps and they are uh, they are all called some they are called called Hoff maps. Okay? So they are associated to the Hoff invariant one theorem which is a very famous which was a very famous problem in homotopy theory which was solved by Adams in the 1950s. So Adams basically showed that these constructions which I'm doing, this is the last step. After this, there is no further uh, map like this. And they are also related to the group structures on spheres. Okay, so these are the, uh, these are some non-trivial classes which are detected by cohomology operation. Now, uh, once you have some non-trivial classes, there are some operations which can be used to generate more homotopy classes. These are called higher order homotopy operations. So I will give you an example of this now. I know I am uh, have probably taken some time, but I'll just now give you an example and then I will go into the, uh, by analogy, I will just go into what results are they are used to prove. Okay, so there are higher order homotopy operations and an example is uh, what I'm going to give you now. So these higher order homotopy operations from our point of view in this lecture is that they can, uh, it is like uh, generating new homotopy elements. So it's like uh, when, you, when you have a polynomial algebra, let us say, then you have some generators and you can multiply and generate new elements, right? So, you know, in my previous slide, I had the generators which are uh, eta, nu, sigma. And now I can apply these homotopy operations to generate new elements. So the, so the easiest case of those higher order homotopy operations, so higher order, this is order two, is this. If you have this uh, kind of situation, you have spaces x, y, z, w, and you have maps f, g, h, such that this the two fold composites are all null homotopic. So G circle F is homotopic to the constant map and H circle G is homotopic to the constant map. So it is homotopic, but it is not equal to the constant map. And that is why that is where we can now do this thing. So if you have a map which is homotopic to a constant map, uh, that means this will induce a map from the cone. So if I take X inside, so I can look at the first homotopy that will give me a map from the cone on X to 
z so i can take go from x to uh, to the cone of x and then i apply the first homotopy i go to z and then i go to w another way is you look at the second homotopy that gives a, a map from cone of y to w and i can go from x to cone of x and then i apply the cone on the first map to cone of y to w and you see now you have two maps from the cone of x to w and uh, the map induced on x is the same map namely h circle g circle f so that will induce so if I take the cone of X, union cone of X over X, that's the suspension of X. So this, this induces this red map from the suspension of X to W. Okay. This is called the TODA bracket of F, G and H. And it is denoted by this bracket F, G, H. This is called the TODA bracket. There are also higher length versions of these TODA brackets. And uh, this is a theorem of Joel Cohen uh, from the from uh, quite a while back in the 1960s. This paper appeared. So it says that the stable homotopy groups of spheres are generated from the Hoff maps, you know, the ones which I defined, two eta nu sigma, and they are odd primary analogs. There are some odd primary analogs. These are actually analog for p equal to 2 these are these half maps but the odd primary ones there is one more which will detect the standard operation p1 so they are generated from the half maps they are on odd primary analogs using these higher versions of total brackets excuse me uh, Dr. Basu. yes uh, as per schedule uh, you have only two minutes yeah i will finish uh, in yeah. a second in a, in two minutes. So okay. the result of Joel Cohen is that uh, this, uh, so so this is so as I said that these TODA brackets are used to generate uh, new elements. So to, uh, Joel Cohen should say proved that uh, once you know starting from the Hoff maps and their odd primary analogs, so there is one odd primary analog, you can generate every element in the stable homotopy groups of spheres. But how it is generated, that is a complicated question, but you can generate it. So you can write everything as this kind of higher length brackets. So the spaces appearing in these operations, so you know the X, Y, Z, W, these groups are all wedges of spheres. So instead of having just a sphere, you, you may have a wedge of spheres, okay? So what uh, our, uh, the title of the lecture was the structure of unstable homotopy groups. So for the unstable homotopy groups, uh, we observe that just having TODA brackets do not suffice to prove an analog of Joel Cohen's theorem. So we have to use something called uh, simplicial shaped operations. So this example is, uh, I, I don't, I'm short of time, but this is just an illuminating example why we need it because uh, we have uh, this uh, kind of situation. You see x1, x2, but now I have two maps from x2 to x3, and we have just a homotopy like this. Epsilon d0 is homotopic to epsilon d1, and d0f is homotopic to d1f. So in the stable situation, which is like an additive category, I could have taken d0 minus d1, and then I would have been in the TODA situation, where two maps are null homotopic and two maps are null homotopic. But here I have to use um, some uh, more clever homotopy to get this map from suspension x1 to x4. So that's uh, only the intuition which I will give you for this lecture. And so I have to use a more general kind of operation called simplicial shaped operations. And using that, we can show that all elements of pi k Sn are generated under simplicial shaped operations by the identity map, the whitehead products, the Hoff maps, and their odd primary analogs. And the intermediate spaces appearing in the decompositions are again all wedges of spheres. Okay, so it's an analog of Joel Cohen's theorem in this, uh, in the before stabilization, okay? And 
there is a final com uh, thing is that we can also have allow the suspension operation, which uh, here is no longer an isomorphism, but you can now consider, because you, you have this suspension, you can all consider all the spheres together. And so there we have, we can say that all homotopy groups of spheres are generated under simple simplicial shaped operations and suspensions by the identity map and whitehead products. So the Hoff maps are not required if you allow this suspension thing. You can just uh, generate those Hoff maps using some uh, some identities using whitehead products. Okay, so I think that's yeah, that's the final slide. So I thank you for your attention, and I again thanks thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. Okay, yeah, so I'll stop. Okay, there. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Basu. So any questions or comments or from audience? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think I have just a quick question. So, so what was the main difference between stable homotopy group and unstable homotopy group? Yeah, so let me go to the. So I think. See the if I go to the slide uh, where I. So this is the. So the stable homotopy group is this um, unstable homotopy group is just the ordinary homotopy group because the stable one became more popular uh, because it's more computationally amenable. So it became more popular. So that's why everyone started talking about stable homotopy groups. And so the ordinary homotopy groups then started being called unstable homotopy groups. Oh, I see. So, so, so that those are, those are supposed to be more difficult. So that is okay. why they are uh, called with a separate name. So, so for example, when you take k equal to 1, OK? Yeah. So pi 1 is just the usual fundamental group, right? In the fundamental group, yeah. And what is the stable fundamental group in that case? The stable one, there is, uh, I mean, once you stabilize, all the groups are abelian. So. Uh, oh, I see. So you are taking the abelianization is the stable. Yeah, the abelianization. So if you take the st stable, uh, so if you if you have a space, the yeah. pi one stable will just be you. Uh, it will just be pi n plus one of some high suspension of the space. So it is. Uh, it gets mixed up, you see, because of this. Uh, if I uh, look at this stabilization formula, is, if yeah, I put yeah. k equal to one, it has pi n plus one of sigma n x. Okay, and then you are taking the limit, right? I mean, the yeah, yeah you are taking the limit as abelian group, so it's it gets all mixed up. Yeah. Okay. 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 okay so any any other question from? So, I me, mean, I I was wondering. I mean, I. Somehow uh, miss some of the points probably. So is this stable? This pi k s x is called the stable homotopy group, right? Yeah, it's called the so stable. Are they group. easier to like uh, compute than the unstable ones? Or, um, or why why one introduces? Or what is the point? Like, yes, it is easier to compute. There are more systematic methods of computation. I mean, it's more still system. not known for spheres and okay. for still spheres. Not I mean, it can it it is a immensely compute complicated object even for spheres, but okay. um, it is uh, there are more uh, you know patterns and uh, nice uh, formulas which one can prove. Okay, for but that which is uh, for for which uh, the stable homotopy groups are completely known, but the unstable homotopy groups are not known. Stable homotopy groups completely known is uh, you if you take a finite complex. So for spheres, it is not known. For finite complexes, it is not known. No, I'm saying that something which is not known for unstable, but known for stable. Something which is not known for unstable. See, the thing is, it is almost not known for every space. Unless oh. you cook up some, you know, pathogenic space where it is known. Say, uh, you know, if you define eilenberg maclean space. Right. So by construction, the homotopy group is known huh. like that. Right. <laughs> no, but, but I'm wondering, so you said it's easier to compute than the unstable ones, right? Yeah, That's but it. there is more systematic formula. I more, 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 more tools to like yeah. attack. 
No, yeah, I mean, you, uh, you can understand these things by, uh, you can use homological algebra techniques too, uh, uh, right. which are homological, because this becomes a homology theory. Okay, okay. So you can use some homological algebra techniques to uh, okay. understand that. All right. But, okay. okay, okay. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bostu, for this nice lecture. So we are running short of time. So I invite uh, uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Pranav Sardar from uh, Aishar Mohali. He is assistant professor there. So firstly, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Pranav Sardar, are this here? Yes, he has been. Hello. So, Dr. Yes, uh, Dr. Prano has uh, done his PhD in 2011 from Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University, Kaliyurt under uh, Mahan Nara. And uh, he has also done postdoctoral uh, fellowship uh, from University of California for, for three years after PhD. And after returning to India, he has been the esteemed for faculty at CMI Chennai. And he joined Aishar Mohali in 2016. And his research is just uh, geometry uh, group theory. And he has so many publications in different journals like the Civil Star from the Commissioner of Society. So today uh, <coughs> he is going to talk on uh, some results about quasi convex subgroups of Gromo hyperbolic groups. So over to you, uh, Dr. Pana. I cannot uh, share the screen, so one moment. Okay, uh, take your time. Yeah. Mm. Uh, next to Mike, there is an arrow, sir. Yes, uh, yes, uh, next to Mike. Okay, but can you know, see the... Yes. Yes, now it is mm -hmm. visible. Uh, it is fine. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I really yeah. uh, thank the organizers for uh, the invitation. So today I have uh, <clears throat> slightly changed the title. Some results on quasi-convex subgroups of uh, group of hyperbolic groups and the plan is slightly changed. Uh, although in the abstract I said that the uh, talk is uh, mostly based at uh, on the some recent work uh, with uh, uh, Mahan MJ and my student, uh, Swati Krishna. Uh, but uh, just uh, uh, since I uh, sense that uh, there will be many people in the audience who do not have any prior knowledge of uh, this kind of stuff. So I uh, plan to keep it more basic and accessible. And uh, so I will. Uh, <clears throat> So mostly there will be no proofs in the presentation, but I will uh, define the things and I will motivate. So let us start. Sorry about the spelling mistake in the first page. So <clears throat> the main object of our uh, interest is that uh, uh, finitely generated groups. So suppose I have a finitely generated group and a finite generating set is then one defines what is called the Kelly graph, gamma GS. So this graph has the vertex set, uh, is simply the whole group G, and edge set is this pairs, uh, G comma GS. Okay. So whenever I, I see two elements which differ by some element of the generating set, I put an edge like that. So in this case, one can easily show that this is a connected graph. Okay, and this uh, graph, we can make it into a metric space by assigning length one to every edge. Because then if you take two vertices, so then you take all the edge paths. Okay, so let us say I have two uh, vertices VW. So I will consider all the sequence of vertices, uh, let us say V and then V1, V2 and so on, Vn equal to W. So that uh, vi and vi plus one, they are connected by some edge. So then, uh, so number of uh, uh, these edges that appear in the sequence, so that is the length of this uh, edge path, okay? Now given two uh, points, the uh, D 
distance between the point is that uh, you take all the edge paths connecting this, compute the length and take the minimum of this. Uh, so that will be the uh, distance between two points. So this becomes a matrix space gamma GS. And the length minimizing paths, these are called uh, geodesics. Okay. Uh, and then uh, if you restrict the metric uh, of gamma GS on the G, so G is a subset of a gamma GS, so it's a vertex set. So you can restrict and that is called a ward metric. Sometimes uh, some people may have heard of this uh, ward metric. So in a geometric group theory, what you do is that you uh, you are looking for some properties of these uh, groups, unintelligible groups, such that uh, so uh, so some geometric properties uh, of the Kelly graphs, such that it will not uh, depend on the uh, uh, generative set S. So uh, finite uh, generative, if you start with a finitely generated group, then uh, you can have uh, many possible finite generating set. And for different generating sets, you will have uh, different Kelly graphs. Okay, but we are looking for some geometric properties that will not depend on the generating set. So one such pro uh, property is, uh, is what is called a Gromov hyperbole group or simply hyperbole group. So this was introduced by Gromov. So it says the following: so some uh, group is hyperbole if there is a finite generating set S and a constant d such that if you take three vertices x, y, z inside the gamma g is, okay? And then you join this uh, point by uh, geodesics, x, y, y, z, and z, x, okay? Then you see that any side is contained in the d neighborhood of the union of the remaining two sides. Uh, so x, y, or x, y, I have y, z, z, x, and y, z, I have z, x, x, y, and uh, for the side z, x, I have x, y, y, z, like that. So, so more generally, one can of course define this notion for any metric space, uh, more general metric spaces than uh, the graphs. Graphs, of course, I mean, first of all, other than uh, Kelly graphs, you can do it for any general graph, connected graph, and uh, uh, more generally for other uh, metric spaces, special kind of metric spaces, which, which are called uh, geodesy metric spaces. You can define this notion of Grumong hypervolicity. Okay, so, <clears throat> so in this definition, we have a finite generating set, then you will have a connected graph, and then you have all the geodesic and so on. So it is a basic fact that this hyperbolicity, it is independent of the generating set is that you started with. Uh, so this means that uh, suppose I, this is a hyperbolic uh, for some generating set is, so there is a constant D and so on. Now if I choose some other generating set is prime, then the constant D will change. So the D, D will not be there. So maybe it will be much larger than D, it will be some D prime, but there will be some D prime. So this is a basic fact in this uh, subject, geometric group theory. So it was proved by Grumov that the hypervolicity does not depend on the uh, choice of genetic set. Okay, but the constant D, it, it may become very large, it is possible, but there will be some constant. So that is a hyperbolic group. So today we are going to discuss hyperbolic groups and some special kind of subgroups. So I thought it would be good to have a collection of examples of hyperbolic groups. Then we can come to examples of subgroups. So the, the first kind of example is that of free groups, FN. So it is very easy to see that free groups are hyperbolic because what you can do is that you choose a free basis, okay? So, if, so FN denotes the free group on N generators. So you choose a free basis and then with respect to the free basis, it is easy to see that the Kelly graph becomes a tree. So it is a, a tree where every vertex, uh, it's an infinite tree, where every vertex has a degree or valence uh, 2n. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> in that case of tree, so you just apply the definition of hypervolicity. So maybe I can just uh, go up. So here, so in this definition, you, you see that uh, you can choose d equal to zero in the case of a tree, okay. So any side is contained in the union of the remaining two sides. So you can take the zero neighborhood, okay. So the free groups are hyperbolic and a slightly uh, more difficult uh, example will be that of, uh, so if you take a closed orientable surface of genus bigger than equal to two, then uh, these uh, fundamental groups are hyperbolic. 
So this requires some more work, uh, what is called uh, Minos was lemma, and the fact that this uh, on the hyperbolic uh, and this uh, the surfaces, one can put the hyperbolic metric. So it requires uh, some knowledge. Uh, so more generally, so if you take a fundamental group of uh, closed negatively curved manifold, uh, so then uh, then the fundamental group is hyperbolic. So in particular, if I have a, a hyperbolic closed hyperbolic manifold, then the fundamental group of uh, this uh, manifold is uh, hyperbolic. Okay, and then uh, so more uh, so, but to construct uh, uh, so some example like that is hard, of course. What is easier is to uh, is to construct this kind of examples where you have a finitely present, uh, presented group and the presentation satisfies what is called C prime one by six condition. So these are some small cancellation groups, what are called small cancellation groups. So if they satisfy this condition, then uh, the groups are hyperbolic. So in this way, you can generate many many examples of hyperbolic group. And then there are various combination theorems for hyperbolic groups. Uh, in that way, you can you can find out many more examples. So the first kind of uh, combination theorem that was proved uh, in 1992 by Isvina and Fain, so where they proved that uh, so it's, a, it's a much more general theorem about uh, graphs of groups. So it will be more difficult to uh, explain that. So I will state a special case of that uh, of their theorem, which is that suppose H is a malnormal uh, subgroup. Okay, so I have. Uh, so there is some small mistake here. So suppose I have two hyperbolic groups, G1, G2. G1, G2 are hyperbolic, I missed to state. So G1, G2 are hyperbolic groups and H is a malnormal quasi-convex subgroup. So of course, uh, one of the uh, uh, key word in this talk is uh, that of uh, quasi-convex. So I will define quasi-convex in a moment. So and malnormal, I believe most people know, and uh, but I will define also. So, uh, so if H is a malnormal quasi-convex subgroup of G1, G2, then the, uh, the amalgam okay, G1 uh, star G2 over H is a hyperbolic. So in particular, let us say a uh, typical example will be that uh, suppose G1, G2 are free groups and H is a, uh, H is a cyclic subgroup, okay, so that the cyclic subgroup is, is uh, uh, generated by some primitive element. That is uh, some element which is not uh, uh, power of some other element. Okay, so then this amalgam is hyperbolic. So, and uh, then, then then there was this theorem that uh, if I have a one related group uh, with finitely many generators, so S is finite here, and R is some related, and then I am taking R to the k, uh, k is bigger than equal to two, then this is hyperbolic. And uh, one particular uh, kind of a theorem that is important for this talk is that of this exact sequence kind of things, where I have an exact sequence of, so, so what I'm saying is that uh, this, in this way also one can find new examples. So, so there are these kind of examples of uh, hyperbolic groups, G, such that it fits in some exact sequence like this, where the normal sub uh, the first element is, so this is either free group on three generators or more, and or uh, sorry or uh, this uh, fundamental groups of SG where uh, SG is uh, is a closed orientable surface of genus at least two. Okay, so this kind of example. So I want to uh, uh, say a few words about this uh, example because it is uh, it is uh, it's very important for this talk and uh, some very trivial work uh, went uh, into this uh, thing to find this kind of examples. So. So how does how does one get uh, some example like that? So what we, we do is that we start with the uh, hyperbolic group N, and then uh, you construct this exact sequence. So you take the automorphism group of N, and then we know that this int N is the inner automorphism group. So this is a it's a normal subgroup of out N. Okay, and then you, when you take a quotient uh, out N by this, then uh, you get out N, which is called the outer automorphism group. Okay, so this way you have a natural exact sequence of uh, group. Okay, and in our case, if you go back to the uh, this uh, previous slide, so here n is uh, either free group or it's a surface group, so pi one is g. So here these groups have no center. N is bigger than equal to three in that thing. Okay, so there is no center, and therefore the int n is isomorphic to n. Okay, 
So therefore, I can replace the int n by n. So I can replace um, the understanding that there is some isomorphism. So I have an exact sequence like this, n, out n, out n, and one, like. Then if you take any subgroup q of out n and define g equal to the pi inverse, pi was this mass, so I, yeah, so pi was this mass. So you take the inverse image of q, so you call it g. So then we have an exact sequence like this, n, g, q. So then therefore, the natural question is, when is this g hyperbolic? So you started uh, with the uh, hyperbolic group n, and you build this sequence, and uh, q is something. So typically what you want is that if q has some special property, then g will also have that special property. So we are asking, well, how can you choose the q such that g is hyperbolic, OK? So the first attempt at this uh, question was uh, given by this uh, very important paper of uh, Farb and Motion in 2002, OK? And then uh, followed by Hammenstadt in 2005 and independently Kent Leininger in 2008, where they clarified the full picture and answered this question. It's a very nice uh, answer. When, uh, how to choose the skews as that uh, G hyperbolic? But uh, yeah, so uh, so the point uh, here for uh, everybody to take is that there are these kind of examples where Q is uh, is a hyperbolic group basically. And G is hyperbolic, and N is a free group or pi one is G like that. Okay, so this was the case for the N equal to the pi one is G, and uh, for, uh, inspired by this, uh, in very recently 2018, Spencer Dowdell and Sam Taylor they proved the analogous result for this uh, free group case. Okay, so in this uh, both the cases, the groups are Q, these are called convex Q compact. They arise very naturally in geometric group theory, so they are of very much importance. Okay, so this is uh, one example that will concern us. Uh, so I said uh, things so much about this. So, and the next, uh, yeah, so as I said, the, the, the main keyword of this, uh, this talk was the hyperbolic groups and quasi convex subgroups. So, a subgroup G of a, uh, sorry, subgroup H of a hyperbolic group G is called quasi convex if for some generating set S, there is a constant K. So, I'm sorry about the Notation. Notation is not very good here. So H is subgroup and K is a constant. So uh, such so that the following holds. So what is that? So you take H and H prime two elements inside the group H. Okay. So this H is a subgroup of G and G is sitting inside the gamma GS. Okay. So in the gamma GS, you join H H prime by some geodesic gamma. Okay. Then this gamma should be inside the D neighborhood of the H. So all this is all this is happening in the gamma GS. So something is so so, so motivation behind the, in, so you know in the Euclidean geometry. So we <coughs> define the so-called convex subset. So you, you take uh, maybe R three and then some subset is uh, convex. If, 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 if given any pair of points in the subset, you join them by the line segment. The line is fully contained inside the so segment. Is completely contained in the set. Then you call it. A, <coughs> convex subset. So similarly, since we are doing some coarse geometry, so therefore uh, we we uh, we don't expect that much. Okay. So because I said uh, so, we are looking for some properties which are independent of the generating set. Okay. So if I just define convex like that in the Kelly graph, yes, I can do that, uh, but it will be very limited. One cannot do anything with that. There will be no examples, almost no examples. Okay. So therefore, we define just a little bit variation of that. So what you do is that you are defining quasi convex. So what is uh, what is this? So you given a pair of points, the geodesic maybe it's outside each maybe, but uh, it is contained in a small neighborhood of that subgroup. So then in this case we call it a quasi convex subgroup. Okay. So and uh, for this nice thing about the uh, <clears throat> uh, pronoun. Yeah. That N D D would be K, no? Yeah, sorry, yeah, D should be K, correct. Yes. D should be K. It's contained in the K neighborhood of this. That is that's correct, yes. So and uh, mm, the nice thing about the, the this concept, quasi convex, as I said, so it will not depend on the generating state. So su suppose the H is uh, satisfying this uh, property for some gamma G S, then it will of course uh, satisfy it. Uh, in, and the gamma G S prime also you satisfy if S prime is another finite generating set. 
So this property is really independent of the genetic set. Okay. So as I said, so this is a very like natural concept to define. And uh, uh, so if you ask me why we consider this, or why are we interested in this uh, kind of subgroup? So you see that it's very natural first of all. And then you will see it has many more properties, interesting properties. Okay, so therefore it is something good. So, so the first thing that you notice is that the quasi complex subgroup of the hyperbolic group. So uh, this is finitely generated. So uh, actually for this finite generated thing, we don't need hyperbolicity. <coughs> it's good enough to have any finitely generated group and any Kelly graph, then you will have that this age is finitely generated. But uh, for hyperbolicity, G is hyperbolic, then it will imply that this so age is Yeah. Uh, question. It should be that, okay, D is should be K and your general S is of age, right? Uh, no, S is a generating set for uh, the group G. Group G, okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay, okay. So we are defining the Kelly graph, uh, gamma G S. Okay, so it's a generating set for the group G. So the nice thing about uh, the quasi convex thing is that they are themselves hyperbolic. So it will follow that they are finitely generated. And so therefore you can construct Kelly graphs and uh, then it will follow that also, that uh, these groups, subgroups are hyperbolic also. So this is one of the interesting properties of this. So now what I will do is that I will discuss various examples of uh, this uh, quasi convex subgroups and uh, some properties. Okay, so, so we start with uh, some algebraic and geometric properties. So. Some of the statements are really very easy. And uh, some people who know this subject, uh, for them, uh, it's like trivial, OK? But uh, since uh, I, 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 I assume they're a mixed audience, so therefore I still state this. So if I have a hyperbolic group G and some automorphism phi. Can I ask a question, Pranav? Yeah, yeah, please go on. The generating set depends on the group H, subgroup H, is it? No, it doesn't depend on the subgroup H. OK. So you have a hyperbolic group G, you take any subgroup H, so then you are asking if it is quasi convex. So you work in any Kelly graph gamma G and see if it is quasi convex. <coughs> so the way you, it looks like uh, as if uh, given a group, you can choose a generating set of H, right? Or no, no, no. So that, uh, uh, yeah, so that is uh, my mistake. Okay. okay, so the statement is the following. Suppose I have a hyperbolic group G and a subgroup H. So I will call it quasi-convex if for some generating set S of the group G, okay. So then uh, the Kelly graph, uh, in, so you can consider the gamma G S. So H should be quasi-convex uh, in that, okay. So that is given a pair of points uh, H, H prime inside, uh, so any point inside H, then uh, any geodesic gamma joining H, H prime, okay, that should be contained in a small neighborhood of H. So this is the... So the D will depend on the generating set S. So if you change your generating set, D will, will, D will change, of course. But there will be something. Is it better now? Yeah, OK, OK, okay. thanks. OK, sorry, I cannot see anybody's face or anything. I just, I'm just looking at my screen, so. OK, so I don't know if somebody would have questions. So please ask, feel free to shout. So if we take any out, out, uh, automorphism of uh, group G, hyperbolic group G, and H is a quasi-convex subgroup, then uh, the image of this H under phi will also be quasi-convex. So this is fairly easy. And uh, in particular, if we take inner automorphism by some group element G, then this is true. So this means that H is quasi-convex, then all the conjugates of H will be quasi-convex. So we are, we are discussing now some of them properties of uh, quasi convex okay and i uh, suppose i have uh, this uh, subgroups the tower of subgroups k subgroup h h subgroup g and uh, this is a mistake so the index of k inside h is finite then h is quasi convex in g even only k is quasi convex in g okay so so for, so for instance of course uh, uh, so in particular that uh, so you see G is quasi-convex in G, there is nothing. So therefore, any finite index subgroup uh, of G will be quasi-convex. <coughs> and also, uh, the, if you take uh, H to be simply the trivial subgroup, namely you have just the identity element. So this is clearly quasi-convex. And therefore, any finite subgroup of hyperbolic group will be quasi-convex by this. Uh, 
And here is an interesting property. So uh, I suppose I have uh, two quasi-convex subgroups, H1, H2. So, so from now on, all our groups are hyperbolic and the subgroups are quasi-convex, unless other are stated. So H1, H2 are quasi-convex, then that intersection is also quasi-convex. Okay. So these are some interesting consequences. I will say something later. So this was approved by Short in 1991. Okay. And then if I have quasi-convex, then its index in the normalizer is finite. Okay. So in particular, suppose I have hyperbolic group G and I start with some infinite index, infinite subgroup. Okay. And some, suppose this is normal also. Then H is not quasi-convex, right? So because of this, uh, this result. Okay. So if H were quasi-convex and also normal, then uh, G mod H would be finite. Okay. But I am assuming these things. So I, I should have said here H is uh, infinite. So otherwise, this would be false. Like if you take uh, H to be trivial, then of course it is false. So if H is infinite quasi-convex subgroup, then this, uh, then this is true that the index of H inside its normalizer in G is fine. Like this. So we have seen some examples of exact sequence of groups, right? So one going to N, going to G, going to Q like that, where all the groups were hyperbolic. So in this case, the, the N that is normal. So therefore those things are not quasi complex unless Q is finite. And then some other similar properties uh, like this, it's a little generalization of this you can see. It was proved in 1998 independently by some group of people and then they wrote this paper together. So this GMR stands for uh, Yitik and uh, Mahan and Reeves and Sagib. So they proved that if suppose I have a public group and I have quasi-convex subgroup, then the height of H inside G is uh, finite. So this means the following. <coughs> there is a number N such that you start with a set of left cosets of H inside G so that this number is bigger than n. <coughs> okay. Then this intersection is finite. This is finite. So this is very, very much against uh, the normality. So very much far away from normality. So if h were normal, then this is equal to h. So if your subgroup is infinite, this will be infinite. So yeah. So in this, in this thing, in this result again, I should say that this is uh, infinite quasi-convex subgroup. Then its height is. Uh, Finite. For finite, uh, so by definition, it will be, uh, yeah. So th that is, uh, yeah. So, so this is interesting only when h is infinite. You say, okay. So if h is infinite, then of course, easy cannot be normal because, uh, yeah. So it will be h always. So this is, you can say, it is a generalization of this. So like that. And height of g is uh, sorry, height of h inside g is simply this uh, the minimal. Uh, integer n, okay, one is n such that this property holds. Okay, so height is n. If uh, if you take uh, n is the smallest integer such that if you take uh, n plus one left cosets, distinct left cosets, and take the corresponding uh, conjugates and intersect, that is finite. So that is height. So <clears throat> a particular case of this, we so we is is. Uh, something that is, I should stress. So suppose I have G any group and H is subgroup, then H is called malnormal. If I take any G uh, outside H inside G, and then uh, H intersection G H G inverse is equal to one. It is called uh, malnormal. And if I want this property uh, for, I mean, just replace this uh, trivial by finite, then uh, it is called weakly malnormal. I, I, I did not uh, complete the sentence here. That's a typo. Yes. Okay. I mean, the, so it's malnormal if you take something out from uh, G outside H in the intersection of H with G, G inverse is trivial. And it is weakly malnormal when I replace the trivial by saying it is a finite. That's weakly malnormal. And then one can easily check from the definition that weakly malnormal is the same thing as saying height is one. Okay. And uh, so then there is a, this, this very interesting famous question of uh, Saru, which asks the following. So if G is a hyperbolic group and H is a subgroup of G, then uh, such that the height is uh, 
finite. Okay. So for instance, you can start with the malnormal circle. Then one is uh, interested in if H is a quasi convex. Okay. So it was a theorem of the GMRS that this is true. If H is quasi convex, highly finite. So he is asking the opposite question. So this is a very famous open question. And uh, recently, uh, Mahan and Subhadra uh, Das they proved that uh, uh, if you take a free group on two generators, two generators, then there is an infinitely generated malleable subgroup. So we, we have seen that quasi-convex subgroups are finitely generated and they are themselves hyperbolic. So therefore, uh, uh, quasi-convex subgroups cannot be infinitely generated. So what they have constructed is, is an example where the subgroup is infinitely generated and malnormal inside the free group on two generators. Okay. So therefore, uh, so we should really strengthen the question by saying that okay, H is finitely generated. So if you have this question, then then uh, no general answer is known. So one special case is known. I mentioned. So I move on. So time is passing. So I. Now do it quickly. So I already mentioned that finite groups and finite index of groups uh, was equal mix. So, so here I am going to uh, describe some examples and some theorems uh, that will give more examples of quasi convex subgroups. So these are these are very old theorems. So this was proved by Groom. So if you take two elements, uh, infinite order elements G H in hyperbolic group G, then there is some integer n, okay, such that G to the n and h to the n, they will generate a free and quasi convex subgroups. Of course, this can be z also, it is possible. Okay, so in this case, we will say they are uh, kind of dependent element, and otherwise, they will be independent infinite order element. So, in those cases, uh, uh, you will get a free group on two generators and quasi convex also. So, this is uh, this will give you a plenty full of examples of quasi convex uh, free subgroups inside uh, any hyperbolic group. Okay. Uh which is not about yes uh, please uh, conclude uh, we are running uh, already 10 minutes late so you say it again i am saying that please conclude within one or two minutes we are already okay. running so i'll just quickly finish then okay so hyperbolic group is uh, called locally quasi convex if any finitely generated subgroup is quasi convex okay so these are very special kind of hyperbolic groups and uh, very few examples are known. So for instance, free group and uh, this phi one is G, they will have this property. Okay. And in 1997, Rita Gittig proved a generalization of this. So she proved some kind of com combination theorem where you start with some locally quasi convex subgroup and uh, some kind of amalgam will be locally quasi convex. And uh, uh, like I said, uh, this uh, special case of uh, Swarup's question. This this one such instance is this theorem. So this was proved by Mohan in 2004 that uh, if you have hyperbolic groups G1, G2, and H is a common quasi convex subgroups of G1, G2, you take the amalgam, and suppose the amalgam is also hyperbolic. Then if G1 has finite height in the amalgam, then it will be quasi convex. So this is uh, the un answering the question of Saru in a very special case like this. He had proved uh, something more also, but I am not saying that. And uh, here is another kind of interesting theorem. So 1990s, Squad and Sorok, so they proved that suppose we have an exact sequence of hyperbolic groups like this. Okay. Where, and uh, suppose H is, uh, H is an infinite index subgroup of this pi 1 SG. It's a finitely generated infinite index subgroup like this. Okay. So pi 1 SG, remember, this is normal inside G, so this, therefore this is not uh, quasi-convex. And I am starting with something quasi-convex here, not in G. So the result is that H is quasi convex in G. So this was, uh, they, they proved it using some Kleinian groups and so on, hyperbolic geometry. They proved this. And this was generalized uh, by Mahan. Okay. So Mahan proved the same thing for free groups. Okay. So uh, suppose I have this, uh, this, uh, so phi is some automorphism of Fn. So you take the similar product and assume this hyperbolic. And moreover, assume phi is fully reducible. So this is something that one needs to. Explain, but I don't have time. So then, in this case, suppose H is an infinite index subgroup of this Fn, finitely generated. Then this is quasi convex in G. Okay. And then MJ and Rofi in a recent paper, they have generalized these two theorems. One is that of Mitra and then Scott sort of theorem by proving more general theorems. So suppose you have exact sequence of groups where n is either this pi one is G 
or a fail, and Q is what is called a convex Coke matrix group of out uh, n. Okay, okay, and uh, suppose this is a hyperbolic uh, extension. Okay, and uh, then this uh, H H is an uh, infinitely uh, infinite index finitely generated subgroup of uh, n. Then this will be quasi convex inside G. So this was uh, this theorem of N zero p, and uh, here is uh, our theorem. So uh, with Mahan, I prove that uh, suppose we have we are in that situation above, so where we have exact sequence of uh, groups, and uh, suppose that uh, Q one inside Q. So let us uh, just one moment. So I will take a subgroup here Q one, and I will take the inverse image of that inside G. So that will be called uh, a G one. This is that. Okay. And uh, so suppose H H is a subgroup of G1, which is quasi convex in G1, and it is of infinite index also in G1. Then the then the theorem is that H is quasi convex inside G. Okay, so this generalizes this previous theorem of M J Rofi. So for them, they took this N and took a subgroup. So we are taking a Q1 here, taking inverse image, and then the subgroup of that. So if Q1 is trivial, so we are getting the special case of uh, Previous theorem. Of course, the, we are not saying that we are proving that we are proving this result using the previous. So this was the like uh, last thing that I wanted to say. I wanted to say a few words about the proof, but I'll skip that. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, thanks to the organizer again for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pano. Uh, any questions or comments, please? Well, we are already late, so, so I think those who are having questions uh, may contact Dr. Prana or through email also. So now I am handing over to Professor Banteshwar Tiwari from BHU Baranji uh, for chairing the next session. Over to you, uh, Professor Tiwari. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, Professor Gauri Sinkaji. Yeah. So the next speaker of this symposium uh, is Professor Subhajoy Gupta. Uh, Professor Subhajoy, are you here? Yes, yeah. I, I'm here. Yeah, I just shared my. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let me introduce Professor Subhajoy. Uh, Professor Subhajoy is uh, at present. He is. Uh, at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and uh, he got his PhD from Yale University. Um, he was also postdoc uh, uh, jointly at Caltech, and uh, uh, there is a center of quantum geometry of moduli spaces uh, in Denmark. So he was postdoc there um, before joining this Indian Institute of Science, and his research interest is uh, uh, attachment theory and low-dimensional geometry. Today, uh, he will talk on the monodromy of Schwarzian equations uh, on a punctured sphere. So, over to uh, Professor Subhajoy. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and I thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, symposium and this conference and happy to see and uh, virtually some of my friends and colleagues from across the country. So, so, so this is the title of my talk and I will sort of explain what all this uh, are. I should mention this is uh, 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 part of joint work with Gianluca Farraco. Um, and, um, and although the title of my talk, I have a punctured sphere, our work is actually much more general. It's, it's for any punctured surface. So, so here's a, a punctured sphere, uh, a k-punctured sphere, and, and throughout the talk, I'll kind of assume that a k is uh, at least three, so that the punctured sphere has negative Euler characteristic. And uh, on this topological surface, you can give a Riemann surface structure very easily. You can think of uh, the Riemann sphere and puncture it at k points. Okay, and when I, when I think of a Riemann surface instead of a topological surface, I'll often denote it by this letter X. And of course, I can also choose um, uh, these three of these K points to be zero, one, and infinity. Um, and sorry, so there's, a, there's a zero here as well. And, um, 
uh, and these uh, the rest of the uh, of the points are like moduli of of, of of these punctured spheres, right? And what so what's the Schwarzian equation? So the Schwarzian equation is this very simple uh, second order linear differential equation, uh, where u is the unknown function. Okay, so it's the function of this punctured sphere x. Uh, I've I've thought of uh, z as the coordinate on on the complex plane, which is sort of the affine chart on, on CP1. Um, and, uh, and so Q is, is, a, is a, a given coefficient um, uh, uh, that, is, that is holomorphic away from the punctures and has poles of order at most two at the punctures. So these are what are called regular singularities. And, and just a, a sort of a technical point uh, here for, for, for to be pedantic is that this uh, Q coefficient Q, although I've sort of written it as if it's the function, it's actually it should be thought of as a as a quadratic differential, um, because you know if you want to check a, a regular singularity at infinity, which is I'm assuming is one of the punctures, uh, so you have this equation uh, when you convert it to local coordinates around infinity, it, it transforms this coefficient Q transforms as a as a quadratic differential, which is like a zero to tensor. Okay, and um, so, so this here's an example of uh, so some Schwarzian equation where this coefficient looks innocuous enough, it's less of one by z, but turns out that at infinity, it's not regular, it has a pole of order three, which is greater than two. Okay, so, um, so that's just a kind of a technical point. But there's this equation, this uh, Schwarzian equation arises uh, very naturally in many contexts and sort of classical example of this is the Gauss hypergeometric equation on a thrice punctured sphere. Uh, and in, in fact, this arose uh, uh, in today's talk in the morning, uh, in the, one of the plenary talks. Okay, so, um, uh, so, so since it is a linear differential equation of second order, one of the things we know is that it locally has a, a solution always. So here I've chosen a base point Z naught on the punctured sphere. And, and so it, if you fix the value of that unknown function and its derivative at, the, at that base point, you can, one can always define a, a solution in a neighborhood of Z naught as by some kind of power series. And this is where the fact that, you know, your singularities are regular also helps. Uh, to show convergence of that power series. And uh, it's a linear differential equation. So if U0 and U1 are two solutions, which are linearly independent, any linear combination of them is also a solution. Okay, And, and so there's a vector space isom isomorphism uh, of the space of solutions uh, in a neighborhood uh, with the two-dimensional vector space, okay, C2. So, the, so the, it's a vector space of dimension two because it's a second order linear differential equation. And you can um, analytically continue solutions. So, uh, so you can start with a neighborhood of this base point, and then you can sort of keep uh, drawing. Uh, so let me sort of draw some of neighborhoods successively along a loop that goes around the punctured sphere and perhaps come, as comes back to Z naught. And if you do this, then um, this basis of solutions u not u1 that you might take at the beginning uh, uh, might analytically continue and come back to two different solutions, which are two different linear combinations of, uh, of u not and u1, which are denoted by a uh, uh, u not plus b u1 and c u not plus d u1. And this matrix a, b, c, d is going to be an invertible matrix because you can go around the loop in the other way and then get the inverse. And it turns out that it only depends on the homotopy class of this loop. Okay, so um, so it defines this representation, this homomorphism from the fundamental group of the punctured sphere to GL2C. And I, I should also mention that um, this uh, is only up to conjugation because uh, uh, you know uh, to define the matrix, I chose this basis, and there's also this base point that I've dropped now. So, so it's this monodromy representation is determined up to conjugation. And, and um, I'll, I'll s s sort of say this very quickly, but you know, this concept of having a monodromy of a 
uh, of a solution of a differential equation is is uh, so illustrated by uh, the the function log of z, uh, which and this log of z and one are two linear independent solutions of a certain second order linear differential equation, which I won't write down. I haven't written down, um, and uh, this is on a defined on a punctured plane. Uh, 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 a Riemann sphere with two punctures at zero and infinity, if you like. And the monodromy of the loop around zero is non-trivial because if you uh, if you go around uh, one of these, uh, 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 go around a loop around uh, the origin, this solution log of z transforms to log of z plus two pi i. Okay, and so this monodromy matrix is it looks something like this. It's a, some kind of parabolic element, um, some unipotent element. Okay, and and so um, what? So that's the monodromy representation. And what we'll actually do is we'll projectivize. So instead of looking at uh, the vector space C two of uh, solutions of, uh, of germs of solutions uh, uh, around points, um, we look at ratios of linearly independent solutions. So so there's a, instead of u zero and u one as an element of the vector space. C2, we think of u0 by uh, divided by u1. And uh, once again, analytically continuation sort of takes you to this other ratio here. And this time the monodromy representation is to the projectivized general linear group PGL2C and also denoted by uh, PSL2C, which is the same thing uh, for this field. Okay, so, um, and then the basic question, and this is what we answer, um, is what representations do you get this way? Okay, so, um, so, so before I kind of uh, talk a little bit more about this basic question, let me tell you the sort of general, slightly more general context where you have a, uh, this goes back to the 19th century, and this is uh, the context of linear systems of differential equations of first order. So, so here, talking about uh, y, which is an unknown vector-valued function. It takes values in Cn, and A is an n by n matrix with uh, holomorphic or meromorphic entries with that most simple poles. That's the analog of regular singularities for first-order systems. And once again, you can talk of the monodromy uh, as you go around loops uh, uh, in this punctured sphere. And this then the monodromy is to uh, the linear group GLNC, and, and so here also you can ask what are the sort of the, uh, um, the representations that arise this way. And this is the famous Riemann-Hilbert problem, also Hilbert's 21st problem. And this was uh, solved uh, in the course of the 20th century. And this is a kind of a long history that I won't get into. Um, uh, but, but these are for first order linear systems. And, and so, Ours is a second order linear differential equation, which is, can also be thought of as a linear system uh, with rank two, uh, but of a very special form. Okay, so, so this is like a slightly more general context. So back to our basic question. So you can um, uh, sort of, so you can frame this basic question this way. So it's on the left-hand side, we have Schwarzian equations on the punctured sphere. So where you kind of vary that coefficient Q, that quadratic differential, and you have a monodromy map to representations of the fundamental group to PSL2C up to conjugation. And the question is, what is the image of this monodromy map? And uh, it, sort of back in 1887, Poincaré observed in a paper of his that the dimensions of these two spaces on, on the domain and range are, uh, are actually equal. Okay, and based on that, he sort of uh, proposed a kind of uh, he remarked that uh, the, this map is in general onto. Okay, so he sort of, this is a vague comment. So I've kind of reproduced this comment from the paper here. It's in French, of course, but I've kind of tried to translate it uh, down below. Um, and it says that one can in general find a Schwarzian equation uh, with given monodromy. You can sort of ignore this without apparent singularities for now, so to sort of. Uh, um, and, but but this in general is sort of within italics in, in his paper, so it's his uh, italics. Okay, so so as I said, our main theorem actually answers, uh, clarifies this remark and sort of um, answers this basic question, characterizes this image of the monodromy map of the Schwarzian equation, not just on a punctured sphere, 
but on any Riemann surface of finite type. Uh, and uh, again, you can ignore this comment of with or without apparent singularities. Okay, so um, our approach uses some geometry topology, in particular these geometric structures on surfaces called complex projective structures. So let me define what a complex projective structure is. So a complex projective structure is an atlas of charts to um, the, the, the Riemann sphere, CP1, so that the transition maps on overlaps are restrictions of elements of PSL2C. These are Mobius transformations. So maybe I should sort of say that these restrictions, they look like Z goes to AZ plus B and CZ plus D. These are, these are the automorphisms of CP1. So locally, the surface looks like it's a Riemann sphere. It's a, it's a geometric structure modeled on CP1. And, and uh, in particular, these are Riemann surfaces because uh, you know, so these uh, transition maps are holomorphic, but these are holomorphic maps of a special kind. These are uh, restrictions of Mobius transformation. So this is a special atlas. And these always exist on a Riemann surface because of the uniformization theorem. So because hyperbolic structures, uh, which I'm sure people have heard about, are uh, examples of complex projective structures. So a hyperbolic structure, you um, have charts to the hyperbolic plane, but that can be thought of as the upper hemisphere in CP1. And, and PSL2R are real Mobius transformations. So, um, okay, so, so, uh, so they always exist. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, as I mentioned, the word geometric structure this is also known as a GX structure. For, uh, there's a more general notion where G is a Lie group and X is a homogeneous space. And, and CP1 structures are examples of that more general um, geometric notion of a geometric structure, a GX structure that goes back to um, Carta, Erisman, Thurston. Okay. Um, now there is a, a more global description. Instead of I talked about charts, local charts to uh, the uh, to CP1, uh, but you can sort of have more global description in terms of uh, a developing map. And this developing map you obtain by piecing together these charts to CP1 to get a globally defined map. You can't quite do it on the surface because when you go around loops, the initial and final chart might, uh, might differ by some element of PSL2C, but you can do it in the universal cover where uh, there are no loops. Right? And you get this developing map, which is um, uh, in general, it's an Im in immersion and it's equivariant with respect to a monodromy or holonomy representation uh, uh, from the fundamental group to PSL2C, okay? Um, and it sort of, it takes it, the action of the group, uh, of the fundamental group acting by deck translations to action of a Mobius group, which is the image of this representation acting on CP1. Okay. So, um, so th there is uh, this uh, more global way of defining a uh, complex uh, projective structure in terms of this developing map and a holonomy representation. Uh, in particular, for a hyperbolic structure, uh, this developing map is actually a homeomorphism, a diffeomorphism that identifies the, the universal cover with H2, and this monodromy is a Fuchsian representation. It's a discrete um, uh, representation uh, into PSL2R. Okay, and, and sort of uh, the developing map sort of develops onto, uh, here I'm talking about a punctured sphere, so it develops onto the styling of H2 where these um, ideal polygons and, and the quotient, uh, so this gives you a, a hyperbolic sphere with, with cusps at the punctures. Okay, okay so, um, uh, so this is an example and more generally you can sort of define other complex projective structures by taking certain domains in the complex, uh, well, in, in the complex projective line in CP1 and identifying sides by Mobius maps. Um, and so you can sort of uh, synthetically construct these objects as well. Okay, and so what's the connection with the Schwarzian equation? Well, the Schwarzian equation, um, it, it turns out that this is sort of closely related to CP1 structures. Uh, namely, we have this bijection. You have Schwarzian equations on 
a hyperbolic surface is in bijection with complex projective structures on X. Okay, and, and so what's the, uh, so okay, let me sort of quickly give you an idea of the proof. So in one direction, we kind of already have seen what happens. So if you have Schwarzian equation, uh, which is uh, which I've kind of written down here again, uh, ratios of linearly independent solutions give you charts to CP1, and so this defines a complex projective structure. Then in the other direction, if you have a complex projective structure, and how do you find this Schwarzian equation? How do you find this coefficient quadratic differential Q? Well, it turns out you can sort of uh, recover that from the developing map by taking the Schwarzian derivative of the developing map. So the Schwarzian derivative has this complicated formula, but this is a very naturally occurring um, sort of concept that appears when one talks about Mobius transformations. Okay, um, and, and in our case, we are considering Schwarzian equations with regular singularities at the punctures. And uh, let me just mention that, in, so that corresponds to complex projective structures with certain properties of the developing map near the punctures. And I'll sort of have mentioned it here. So the developing map has, has uh, uh, these two forms, and which, uh, which I'll call a cusp or a cone. Okay, so I won't get into that too much now, but the basic question, therefore, that we started off with can be thought of as asking, so if you have complex projective structures uh, with cusps or cones on the punctured sphere, you have the monodromy map, it takes, to representations um, uh, up to conjugation. So what is the Im image? So this is sort of equivalent to that question about monodromy of Schwarzian equations that we started off with. Okay, um, so now before stating our theorem, let me just mention something, uh, uh, so an example of a representation not in the image of the monodromy map. So something that doesn't appear as the monodromy of any complex projective structure with cusps and cones on a punctured sphere. And, and this is this uh, uh, is a very simple representation which uh, uh, where the, the, the loops around the punctures, so, so maybe I should, I should kind of indicate what gamma i are, because the gamma i's are these loops around the punctures which generate the fundamental group. Um, so these all map to these particular parabolic elements, these, uh, uh, these what are translations in PSL2C, okay? Um, and, and it turns out that this uh, cannot have, I mean, it cannot arise from a, a complex projective structure. And um, maybe I'll, I'll sort of skip the reason why this region is, is some, a topological reason. And, and presumably, I mean, so Poincaré was aware of such examples because that's why he kind of wrote in general in, in sort of in italics in, in his uh, remark, okay? Um, but uh, so this sort of is helpful to kind of motivate this following definition, which we need for the statement of the theorem. So representation is said to be degenerate if either every element is parabolic and fixes a common fixed point, uh, P uh, in, in CP1. Remember that these groups PSL2C act on CP1 uh, and or they, they fix a pair of points. Okay, so each uh, the glo the group globally fixes a pair of points uh, on CP1. Okay, uh, and, and and it's said to be non-degenerate if it's not one of these two possibilities. And those who kind of know about elementary representations and so on, uh, reducible and uh, representations would recognize that this these conditions immediately imply that the degenerate representation is both reducible and elementary okay so but but in general it's uh, it's sort of the, the reverse implications are not true and there are sort of uh, examples so it's a distinct notion from being reducible or elementary and so here's the theorem um, uh, of ours so so once again i'm only stating it for punctured spheres uh, here so representation of the punctured sphere group which is just a free group to be able to see arises at the monodromy of a complex projective structure if either this is a non-degenerate representation or in case it is degenerate it has at least one puncture where the monodromy around the puncture is identity this is these are what are called apparent singularities that sort of briefly appeared uh, earlier and i didn't define what they are okay so um 
so so if you are degenerate representation like the one uh, you kind of um, sort of mentioned as a non example you need to have at least uh, one apparent singularity okay now for closed surfaces there's an analogous result by gallo kapovich and marden um, uh, that is some time ago, 20, uh, more than 20 years ago now. Um, and, uh, and our result, as I mentioned, is, uh, is for any punctured surface of negative Euler characteristic. Um, and it, it turns out, so I didn't state it for higher genus surfaces, I stated it only for the punctured sphere, but in the higher genus, there are more uh, exceptions. So the, the trivial representation cannot be uh, uh, sort of achieved uh, realized as the monodromy of a complex projective structure if there are only one or two punctures, for instance, in higher genus. And, and the other exception is if there's one puncture and you start with a representation whose image is a group of order two in uh, PSL2C. Okay, um, all right, so, so, uh, so there are these, um, so we kind of answer this question in, in full. Um, and let me also mention that um, for representations to translations, so so I talked about um, these uh, the, the, that non-example mapping to translations. You can think of the translation group. Translations are examples of Mobius transformations, and so this you can think of this as a as sitting as a, a subgroup of of PSL2C, and uh, so these are very special examples of complex projective structures called translation structures. Um, and uh, so in this case, the uh, result was proved uh, in a, a separate article of uh, mine with uh, Shabarish Chennagot and Gianluca Farako. And in this case, this is sort of, as of independent interest. This is related to prescribing periods of meromorphic differentials on Riemann surfaces with respect to choices of complex structures. And then. So anyway, so, um, um, so there is this... Uh, 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 sort of a special case which is of independent interest. And uh, let me um, end with this, one of the open questions that kind of are still left over. So, so I talked about when a representation arises as the monodromy of a complex projective structure. So our theorem, you know, sort of answers that, characterizes those representations. But you, you, can, uh, you can ask, you know, in how many ways does it appear as the monodromy of a complex projective structure. Uh, and, and so these are the fibers of the monodromy map. And, and, and our work actually implies that these fibers are infinite. So there are infinitely many pro complex projective structures. Uh, if, if one exists, there are infinitely many with that particular monodromy. And uh, so, but in general, this is uh, sort of what these infinite sets look like is, is, uh, is quite an open problem. And in a special case where of a thrice punctured sphere, but there are only three punctures, this is sort of the classical Gauss hypergeometric kind of situation. Um, uh, so this was recently uh, studied and answered by these people, Ballas, Bowers, Casella, and Ruffoni. Um, and, but but uh, sort of in general, this problem is quite open. Okay, so um, I guess I'll finish a little ahead of my time, although we're running late. Um, so thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Subhajai. Yeah, is there any question or comment? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yes, please. Sure. please. Yeah. yeah, in this non degenerate, do you have an algebraic criteria of non degenerate representation? Sorry. Like... Um, not really. I mean, so it's a sort of a dynamical criterion, if you like. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. So it's sort of, uh, it's, um, yeah, I mean, there are certain implications, as I said, I mean, the sort of de non-degenerate, I mean, irreducible right. elements would be, uh, irreducible representations would be non-degenerate, so non for instance, so there is sort of, but there's no characterization in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's similar to non-elementary, for instance. I mean, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's more of a dynamical kind of characterization. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so I think there is no more questions. So uh, thank thanks, Professor Subhajai, uh, for your excellent talk. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank the organizers. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. So now the next speaker, uh, Professor Urban Kabiraj. 
uh, Arban, ya, Dr. Arban Kabilas. Iya, 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 oke, iya. Can I share the screen? Iya, iya. Yeah, so just uh, can I say something? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. So before Arpan starts speaking, uh, and since we are running it late, and this is the last talk, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, Arpan's uh, talk is the last talk of this series, and on, mm -hmm. I mean, I would like to thank all the speakers mm -hmm. for their wonderful talk, including Arpan, because I know Arpan speaks very well, so he will definitely give a wonderful lecture. So thank you yeah. very much uh, to all the speakers yeah. for their yeah. uh, support to this program and for accepting the invitation and uh, yeah. for spending time on a Sunday. So and also thanks to Gauri Shankar and Bankates uh, uh, yeah. for helping me out in uh, organizing these sessions. Thank you. So thank you everyone. So now Arpan is over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe I introduce Arpan. Yeah. So before starting, so uh, Professor Appan Kaviraj, uh, he got his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And uh, um, after uh, completing his PhD, he, he joined as postdoctoral fellow. Uh, he was actually postdoctoral fellow at Ben Gurion University, Israel. And before joining IIT Palakkar, he was also assistant professor at uh, IIT Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, for a short time and uh, was inspired faculty at Chennai Mathematical Institute. So his research interest is topological, combinatorial and geometric group theory. So today he will uh, talk on Lie algebras associated to closed curves on a surface. So over to you, uh, Arpan. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Professor Tiwari. And thank, thanks to the organizer for allowing me to give the talk. So, um, is my voice clear? Am I audible clearly? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I will start with this uh, sort of a background to the story that I'm going to talk about. And so uh, Dr. Shubhajai already sort of made my uh, work a bit easier because uh, uh, this is uh, something similar to his monodomy representation. So the basic object uh, usually is as uh, like all other talks we are dealing with oriented surface of finite type. And so if uh, sort of if you are uh, familiar with this finite type notation, it's OK. Otherwise, you just think of it as a uh, two dimensional real manifold. And it has some genus G and it has some finitely many boundary components and finitely many function. That's what uh, oriented surface of finite type means. And so for this talk, I will consider our group G to be either SL2K or GLNK. Although for this discussion, we can take any reductively group, okay? But I'm going to focus on SL2K and GL2K. And this K can be any commutating ring in a full generality containing Z, but for this talk, you can just take it as Z or C or R. That would be enough. So with this setup, we have this one-to-one uh, -one correspondence as uh, sort of like uh, similar to the mon monodromy representation. This is something called holonomy. And so what this says is the following. If you have a principal flat G bundle over surface sigma up to certain equivalence, so you can think of this equivalence as equivalence of principal bundle, up to equivalence flat principal G bundles over sigma are in one to one correspondence with homomorphism from fundamental group to G up to conjugation by G. Okay, so these are virtually the same object. Okay, so studying flat principal bundle over sigma, which is sort of like a Riemann surface, you can think of sigma as a Riemann surface. So vector bundles over Riemann surface has been studied classically for a long period of time. So this is another way, this set of all homomorphism is another way or another interpretation of the same old object. Okay. And uh, one of the, uh, I mean, the, one of the straightforward thing that you can notice with this description of representation is, uh, so here, if you want to define a topology on this is on this space, you can do it using principal B bundles and their uh, sequence sequential notation. Here, it's pretty much easy. What you can do is, this is just homomorphism from fundamental group to G up to conjugation. So this is literally at the top. This part 
just if you forget about the conjugation this is just homomorphism from fundamental group to g and if your fundamental group of your surface is let's say generated by n elements generated by n elements then this homomorphism from fundamental group to g is sitting inside g to the power n so this has a natural topology okay and so this space um, you can think of it as some kind of moduli space the script m sigma g this is just the quotient topology you can put the quotient topology okay so now i am uh, cheating a bit here if you want to go in this generality you have to be very very careful in this quotient but for this talk i will just assume that i am taking a simply quotient by this uh, conjugation action and uh, what i will also assume is this space is smooth although let me clearly state that this is not a smooth manifold it is not even close to being a smooth manifold so uh, to be be uh, precise what i want is i want to have a big enough smooth part of it so i will have a zariski open set of m which is smooth and inside that zariski open set i will have a, a smooth structure so that will be a smooth manifold for me and for the rest of the spaces all the things that i am going to discuss can be extended continuously or algebraically depending on your context depending on how how bad your singularity is okay so for this uh, part of for this discussion we will just assume this to be a simply a manifold okay so this has a smooth structure and another thing this space has is a symplectic structure Okay. so this is a very very classical story this is uh, first, probably this was first observed by andre weil and then uh, narsimhan sort of uh, peterson was the first gave a concrete description for sl2 r case yes sl2 r case and then narsimhan sort of gave a general description in terms of you in in case of unitary group and then uh, later goldman gave a formalization i, I think atiya gave a complete general description for many lie groups and goldman goldman gave an algebraic interpretation to that uh, that description so our story starts here i have this moduli space of representations up to conjugation and it admits a symplectic structure so this is the thing that i need from this uh, slide any question up to this point okay good so now how is the symplectic yeah. structure obtained oh this is this is hard okay so i can i can state how it obtains so if you look at the tangent space of this this is going to be sort of okay i'm cheating here but this is going to be the cohomology with twisted coefficient okay and in the first cohomology so in the first cohomology you have the cup run okay and because i have taken reductively group or simply if you take sl2 or gl2 r you have this uh, conjugation pairing that x and y goes to uh, trace of x y so that gives you a bilinear pair so in the coefficient you put the bilinear pairing and in the cohomologies you put put the cup product if you put them together that will give you a uh, two form that's the symplectic structure although proving that it is non degenerate and close is really really non trivial okay uh, yeah i have to be very Yeah. Any question? Uh, please go. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, any question? No, no. Yeah. Please go okay. ahead. Yeah. So now, so what is the theme? So, yeah. Okay. So what is the theme? So the theme here is now I have a smooth. Uh, I have a manifold with the symplectic structure. So on the set of all smooth functions. i automatically have a poisson algebra structure any symplectic manifold uh any symplectic manifold if you take the smooth functions on a symplectic manifold you can take the hamiltonian and among the hamiltonian with this uh, symplectic form you have a bilinear pairing alternative bilinear pairing and that pairing induces a lie bracket in the set of all smooth functions so set of all smooth functions on a mom give a poisson algebra structure with lie bracket so every free homotopy class of closed curve gives you a smooth function on a momentum so let me explain what is this corresponding so let's say you have a curve alpha free homotopy class of curve alpha in the fundamental group of uh, sigma i take belongs to 
pi 1 of sigma. And then what I can do is every alpha gives me a map trace alpha from trace alpha from M to K. What would be the map? Trace alpha. And remember, this is the space is set of all representation. So trace alpha acting on rho is literally trace of rho alpha. So this is your map. And now, as you can see, that this trace is conjugation invariant. So literally, what you will get is actually this map will be. So this this here will give you a map up to conjugation in pi 1 of sigma. And so pi 1 in fundamental group conjugation means free homotopy classes. So literally every free homotopy class of a closed curve gives you a smooth function on your moduli space, on the moduli space with the simple form. So therefore, because this has a Poisson algebra structure, uh, so this was a question asked by Goldman. He said that can we sort of pull back this Lee bracket into this simply this space of free homotopy classes of closed curve. You can take the uh, vector space generated by them over K and can we define this Lee algebra structure? Okay. And uh, he showed that for G equal to uh, SL2 and GLN, you can actually explicitly give a description clearly in terms of topology. Okay. Uh, is my yeah. So now the point here is when G is equal to GLN, it turns out that what you are going to get is a Lie bracket between the oriented closed curve. But if G is your SL2, let's say G is equal to SL2R or SL2C, here what happens is trace of A becomes trace of A inverse. So rather than getting uh, conjugacy classes in fundamental group, what you will get also is A is equal to A inverse. The trace of alpha is equal to trace of alpha inverse. So literally you will get a map from free homotopy classes of unoriented closed curve. Okay. So you have these two stories, GLN R for GLN R or GLN C, you will get set of all uh, map from free homotopy classes of oriented closed curve. And for SL2, you will get from set of all free homotopy classes of closed curve from R oriented surface. So I will uh, describe these two operations. So Goldman gave a explicit description of how topologically this looks like. So this is what it looks like. So for oriented case or for GLN case, this looks like this. What you do is you take any two free homotopy classes of oriented closed curve and their Lie bracket is summation over epsilon p, the loop product of alpha and beta at each of their intersection point. P belongs to the intersection point and alpha and beta. So you take two generic represented representatives of alpha and beta which intersect transversely and this epsilon p is the sign so you have a oriented surface so if you have two oriented curves at each intersection point if you follow the first uh, tangent vector of the first curve and tangent vector of the second curve you get an orientation if it matches with the orientation of the surface you put plus one if it doesn't you put minus one so that's the description for oriented closed curves and this was what goldman uh, described the second one uh, for the unoriented case or for the sl2 case this is the description. This is a bit more involved. So if I want to define it topologically, so what Goldman did was sort of uh, you put an involution, we take alpha to alpha inverse, and you show that there is a Lie subalgebra of this invariant Lie subalgebra, and restricted to Lie subalgebra, uh, this uh, bracket uh, gives you the unoriented bracket. So what is it topologically? Again, you take two unoriented curves. So this tilde means unoriented curve. So you have alpha and beta. And so at each intersection point, you can resolve the intersection point in two ways. You can either take this one or you can take this one. So this is called zeroth type resolution and this is called infinite type resolution. And what you do is you actually take a signed sum of these two types of resolution. And this is the unoriented. Any questions so far? So this is the topological interpretation of the Poisson bracket of the moduli space. Okay. So unfortunately, for other Lie group, for example, if you try, let's say, U3, or you, uh, or let's say, um, uh, uh, symplectic group of order three, we don't have any such topological description. Unfortunately, for only SL2R and GLN for every n, 
we have this description. Okay. So now, uh, thing is uh, quantization. So if you are sort of a little bit familiar of uh, familiar with skein algebra or not invariant, this bottom picture looks awfully lot like a skein relation. Uh, if you look at this in terms of no, uh, in terms of knots, and if you think of okay, red knot is lying on the top of blue knot, this picture has something very much similar with what is known as Kaufman skein relation. If you are familiar with it, this sort of like uh, be a very stark relation. And this is not a coincidence, and the re reason for this is something called quantization. So because of this moduli spaces and Poisson algebra. Uh, they have uh, quantization, so you can quantize a given Poisson algebra, uh, Poisson algebra, uh, commutative Poisson algebra. So let me go back to my earlier slide. At the base level, they are simply Lie algebras, but if you take their symmetric algebra or universal enveloping algebra, they become Poisson algebra. You can give a Poisson algebra structure. For symmetric algebra, you can actually force the Leibniz rule. Can define the Lie bracket to be satisfying the Leibniz rule in the universal enveloping algebra. You already have AB minus B, so that automatically satisfies the Poisson algebra structure. So now these Poisson algebras admits a quantization, and this quantization was sort of defined by Turayev in 80s, and this is called skein quantization. So here is the quantization. What what is the space that quantizes this Poisson algebra? So you start with polynomials in phone variable x, x inverse, h, and h bar. Just think of them as symbols. And you consider A sigma to be isotopy classes of oriented links. So this is the oriented story. There is parallel and oriented story that I will come come later. So the you consider isotopy classes of oriented links up to convey type relation. So what is the convey type relation? If you have a mutual uh, crossing, that means if you have a link where you have a crossing between two distinct component, distinct link component, then you follow this relation. And if you have a self crossing, that means if you have an intersection among a single component, then you follow this relation, relation two. Okay. And what is this L plus L minus? This is just uh, top to bottom going the other way around, and then you resolve them. And so this is the A sigma. This is the quantization space. Uh, for unoriented, we have similar type of quantization. So this is a bit more involved, but uh, forget about this. This is the base ring where you have to deal with. And so here, what you have to take is regular isotopic classes of unoriented links. Uh, sorry, here it will be unoriented link. So regular isotopic classes of unoriented link. So what is regular isotopy? If you're familiar with uh, sort of uh, Rydermeister moves, regular isotopy means you are only allowed second and third Rydermeister move. The first one is not allowed. So that's what called regular isotopy. And with regular isotopy classes of unoriented links up to Kaufman type relations. So this is what is called a Kaufman type relation. This is something similar to what we discussed earlier for an oriented case. This is just a little bit adjustment because you have to take care of this regular isotopy. And you have extra two small relations here. So again, this what this relation says is simply you relate this four picture. The way you resolve these chains. You sort of put them in a relation. So this has this is a sort of slight generalization to what is called a Kaufman skein relation. And what Turai prove is that this k sigma in case of unoriented uh, unoriented uh, links and this a sigma in case of oriented links, these two skein algebras quantize the uh, universal enveloping algebra and the symmetric algebra of those loop algebra of this loop Lie algebra. So in what uh, uh, in uh, so partially with uh, my collaborator Professor Moira Chess, uh, what we proved is the following: so in case of oriented surfaces, uh, in case of oriented curves, this universal enveloping Lie algebra and the symmetric Lie algebra both has centers which are sort of generated by trivial loops and boundary loops. So let me uh, go back to their definition. So if you look at the definition, it says that if two curves do not intersect, then their Lie bracket is zero. So if some curves is in the center, meaning whose Lie bracket with every other curve is zero, one of the obvious choices are constant curves. Constant curves do not intersect with any other curves. You can make a homotopy to make a decision from any other curve. So that obviously leaves in the center. And anything which is in the boundary or which is homotopic to puncture, you can do the same. 
so the constant curve the punctures and the boundary curves they lies in the center so the question other question was whether that constitute the whole center or not so in my phd work i proved that for the lie algebra they actually constitute the center uh, this result is actually way more stronger version of this this says that not only the lie algebra but its universal envelopic algebra and the symmetric algebra uh, so my, in my phd i did only for the oriented case this is much more general so for the oriented case the universal enveloping algebra and the symmetric algebra both has trivial poisson uh, trivial poisson center trivial meaning they are generated by either trivial loops or loops which are homotopic to boundary or punctures so as a corollary of that as an immediate corollary of that we get that there are this type of skein algebras which is our skein algebra a sigma quotiented by certain elements so you can think of making this x to be 1 or h bar to be 0 and certain relations like that these skein algebras also has centers which are generated by uh, loops or links which are homotopic to boundary or homotopic to constant or empty okay uh, similarly for unoriented case and this is a joint work with moira chess this was a bit harder than the oriented case similarly the universal enveloping algebra and this algebra again generate sent uh, center is generated by the uh, sort of uh, the usual suspect uh, they are the constant loop the boundary loops and loops homotopic to punctures and boundary uh, so now the point is here also for the skein algebras we got uh, this this type of skein algebra up to certain quotient uh, their center is also generated by loops which are homotopic to Uh, generated by links which are homotopic to either boundary or constant loops or loops homotopic to punctures now let me mention two things here uh, if i focus so all these centers so far has been computed for the quotient of the k algebras that to derive into so for example the centers are known for the quotient of this uh, this poisson algebra we don't know what are the center of these poisson algebra the original ones a sigma or the in case of one oriented curve k sigma and uh, a fair warning there are certain if you rather than having this complicated relation if we just forget about x x bar and h and all self crossing and mutual crossing and if i just take pure kaufman relation in case of oriented curves so i take in case of Kaufman relation. What I mean is, I simply take only one variable x, and I take this h r r forgot. I take this to be one, this to be one, and this to be x. So, other, so let let me put it like this: put x equal to one, x inverse equal to one, uh, h to be one, uh, h to be h, and h bar to be one. If you just put this relation here, you get Kaufman type relation. And uh, in 2012, in a I think in a series of paper, Bonahan and Wong shows that for those type of skein algebras, uh, the centers are not the obvious one. You have other type of elements which in the centers they are much more complicated. And so this is sort of a kind of a surprising part for us. We thought that the quotients will have some kind of non-trivial center. Uh, it didn't, and uh, we don't know what happens to the original one. I, I suspect that it will still have uh, obvious centers, but I'm not. Sure about it. Okay, so I won't uh, take much time. I think uh, this is where I want to stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Arpan. So, is there any question? Or comment? So if uh, there is no question or comment, uh, let us thank uh, Professor Arpan for his excellent thank talk. You. Yeah, thank you. So I think this is uh, the last talk of this uh, symposia. So Krishnendu, are you here? Yeah, I am here. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Shall Shall I conclude, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. for you. I'm sorry, but yeah. uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm please, sorry please, for please. keeping you wet. But anyway, I mean, yeah. you know, mathematics yeah, yeah. Uh, is yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah.
Yeah, yeah. On behalf yeah. of uh, IMS and MGM University, I express deep gratitude to all the eminent speakers and convener, uh, Professor uh, uh, Krishnendu uh, sir. Special thanks to Professor uh, Gauri Shankar and Professor Tiwari for chairing the session in between. Uh, here I declare the session is completed. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Asish. Thank you. Uh, it was. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah.